first musicians? I know I was looking at that clock and that clock says we're 545 but this clock says 547 so I'm gonna start us Let's go it is either 545 or 547 depending on which clock you look at but the date doesn't change it is March 10th 2020 um, I'd like to welcome everybody here um, and to begin let's uh, start with our color guard um, the colors are presented this evening by Manatee High School JROTC retired Lieutenant Colonel Philip Mugford and cadets uh, First Sergeant Natalie Rose Rosalies, First Lieutenant Jessica Ibera, First Lieutenant Lana Grunland, and Captain Jordan Painter. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As chair of the school board, it is my privilege to welcome you to this meeting of the school board of Manatee County. Your presence and your participation are an essential element to the, um, and a valuable part of the school board meetings, workshops, and public hearings. To assist the school board in conducting the public's business in an orderly manner, we ask that you please adhere to the following school board meeting protocols. Please silence your cell phone and other electronic devices upon entering the school board chamber. Please respect your fellow citizens and the school board by keeping conversation to a quiet minimum during the meeting. Please note that the capacity for attendance at school board meetings is limited to the 75 seats inside the school board chamber. In addition, there is a section in the back right hand corner being utilized right now <laughs> for wheelchair access and medically necessitated standing. And please refrain from clapping, booing, or speaking out from the audience or engaging in any other behavior that is disruptive to the business at hand. Thank you all for being here tonight. And Mr. Barber, why don't you start us off? Madam Chair, board members, uh, Superintendent Saunders. Uh, each year, the Florida Music Association and its component organizations honor outstanding student musicians and singers with an all-state designation. Manti County, as always, uh, is well represented this year, and uh, we have a great uh, history uh, with the arts here in Manti County. And to tell us more about uh, this year's all state selections, and this is just a portion of them here this evening, is Julie Abair, our curriculum specialist for the visual and performing arts. So, thank you, Mr. Good evening, Chairman Messenger and Superintendent Saunders, and members of the board. 
This evening, it's my privilege to introduce you to some of our most outstanding young musicians who were selected for the Allstate Music Participation in 2020. The Florida Allstate Music Ensembles are auditioned ensembles hosted by the Florida Music Education Association, and each year musicians in grades four through 12 are invited to audition for spots to perform in the Allstate Ensembles. Students begin working in May to prepare with their teachers for the grueling audition conducted in September. Our elementary music students' auditions are recorded and adjudicated by a virtual panel of judges, and the high school chorus audition also includes a written music theory exam. In 2020, approximately 1,000 students from Florida's 67 school districts were selected for participation in the 21 various all-state ensembles. 38 of those students were from the school district of Manatee County. These students rehearsed with their ensembles in Tampa last January, and each ensemble was conducted by a nationally acclaimed expert in music education. Final concerts were presented at the Tampa Convention Center for an audience of close to 3,000. This evening, I am proud to present our Allstate musicians who performed in the various elementary ensembles, middle school chorus and high school chorus. We had 20 students who were selected for those groups. 11 of them are here tonight. I imagine some of them are sitting at home with hand sanitizer. So <laughs> for the brave ones, we have Riley Baker. <laughs> Haley Crane. <laughs> Madeline Gabriel. Sarah Green, Isabella Ingold, Madison Lane, Ava Lee, and Elizabeth Pavoni, who was in two different ensembles. She did the Allstate Elementary Chorus and the Allstate Fourth Ensemble. Mm -hmm. Gabriel Cortez is one, our first middle school musician. And Grace Helton. And Caitlin Crutchoon. And our high school musician who is here tonight is Hannah Brady. So um, we're so happy and proud of their accomplishments, students. Congratulations on your hard work, and I hope you enjoyed your experience in Tampa, and thank you to their teachers and their parents and their principals and to you all for supporting this event and allowing them to go to Tampa for, and ta parents for getting them there. It's a big deal to go up there for three days in a row, so thank you for that. I know Mr. Barber would like to do a picture, and did you want pr teachers and principals yes, up here too? Good afternoon slash evening. My name is David Hahn. I teach at Virgil Mills Elementary. Hello, I'm Sarah O'Kelly. I'm the course director at Hale Middle School. Hi, I'm Marsha Perry Jude, and until January 1st, I was the music teacher at Genewood Elementary. And then I retired, and now Josiah Brooks, who is here tonight also, is the new music teacher at Witt Elementary. And we had seven students in all state and one in district.
being here tonight. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. I'm going to approve the agenda, then we'll do it. Yep. Okay, guys, we're going to move on to approval of the agenda. The chair has found good cause to amend the agenda to include all items listed under agenda amendments on the March 10th, 2020 agenda, updated March 9th, 2020, and posted to the district website, manateeschools.net. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, I've got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Is there any discussion? Yeah, Dr. Hopes, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I've had a motion and I've had a second. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. And if you have a green button, push it. Aye. 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 I need whoever was going to second it to second it on the air. Yeah, I did. You did. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Is um, Mr. Wagner there? I am. I'm online. All right, okay, so we've got two people that have joined us today via phone, uh, Dr. Hopes, who's in Tallahassee, and Mr. Wagner, who's at home. So we will try to reference you guys whenever you um, are needed, and we're going to move on to uh, reports and presentations with Mr. Barber. Madam Chair, we have a little change uh, in... The agenda we're working on a technology issue with our first report and presentation so if possible could we go to our second report? is the board okay with that yes. all right let's move forward Sorry. okay this has to do with an update on the coronavirus uh, in regards to the school district and uh, madam chair I we have a, a number of staff members and we have Dr. Bensey from the health department here to speak to this. And we'd like to ask the board members uh, if possible. Um, we're trying to give sort of a uh, global big picture view of what's been going on the last couple of weeks. So we would ask if you could to hold your questions until the end of this presentation because then I think you'll have more information to help form those questions and I think you'll know who to uh, direct those questions to. So uh, just as a matter of reference, uh, Mr. Wagner, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I want to uh, emphasize that Mr. Wagner is practicing good, uh, healthy hygiene procedures here. He's not feeling well and he did not uh, come into work today. And uh, I think it's highly instructive in the times that we live in that he is participating from home. We're probably going to see a lot more of that as we go through this. And uh, so, but it's good to have Mr. Wagner join us uh, from home. Um, I just want to say, starting out, that uh, the speed and the rapidity of the events of the last couple of weeks has been almost overwhelming. And when I say almost, uh, I'm alluding to the fact of the leadership of our superintendent, our deputy superintendents, um, uh, working in collaboration with the Florida Department of Health, with Dr. Bensey and her team, um, with uh, our principals, our teachers, all our support staff members. Um, we've all been able to join together and uh, move forward, and we're moving forward on a number of fronts. But I want to give you just a little background um, as to sort of how we you know, got here this evening. Um, it was two weeks ago today. Tuesday, February 25th, when you had your last school board meeting in this chamber. Um, I like to refer to that, uh, that time as the good old days. Um, you, I'm sure you remember that uh, uh, that evening we had the Lee Middle School Dan uh, step team here. We had Starlo Galetta make a presentation. Uh, we had other business and we got out of here pretty early. Um, it's also important to know that that very same day, Tuesday, February 25th, 
was the day that the C Center for Disease Control and Prevention first announced that um, for to the American public that it was no longer a matter of if, but a matter of when, that the coronavirus would spread throughout the United States. So that was two weeks ago tonight. Uh, that evening, February 25th, the CDC sent out a tweet that said, now is the time for U.S. businesses, hospitals, and communities to begin preparing for the possible spread of hashtag COVID-19. Again, that was Tuesday, February 25th, two weeks ago tonight. Um, that next morning at the direction of Superintendent Saunders and with the exceptional help of Suzanne uh, Kelly Perez in IT and Linda Lambert in my office, the school district of Manatee County prepared a dedicated space, not only on the homepage of our school district website, but on the homepage of every school website uh, devoted to uh, providing information to update our parents, our employees, and the community on what was going on with the coronavirus um, in the school district of Manatee County. So I'm just going to, if you'd just give me a moment here, I think we can pull this up. I'll let you take a look. but. If you can you see okay you can see uh, this is the home page of our school district website this is the corona uh, virus virus section if you click on here you'll see uh, you know the uh, uh, Florida Department of Health hotline you'll see uh, a number for the local Department of Health if you have symptoms you go on down you'll see the uh, on the the right hand side You'll see uh, the uh, link for the Centers of Disease Control, the Florida Department website, which gives uh, daily updates. Uh, you'll see facts about the coronavirus in both English and Spanish, tips to fight the flu, and uh, then additional information. If you scroll on down, and I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom here because we've been, uh, you can see the updates that we've had uh, since we first introduced this site. Now, I want to say again that that first message from the CDC came uh, on uh, Tuesday, February 25th. This website was in place by the end of the day on Thursday, uh, February 27th. Um, and this page, again, is dedicated uh, to uh, just inform the public and uh, our own employees and parents of what is going on with the school district and coronavirus. Also, on Thursday, February 27th, uh, we sent out a connected phone call message and email message to all our parents employees and employees informing them that we were working closely with the Florida Department of Health uh, as well as emergency management to uh, monitor the developments related to the coronavirus. In that phone call uh, to all parents and employees, we directly stated the need for students and staff to maintain proper hygiene, such as covering their mouth when coughing or sneezing, washing uh, their hands uh, thoroughly and routinely, avoiding touching uh, their eyes, nose, and mouth, and staying home when they were sick. Uh, in addition, we directed them to our website for more information. We also uh, uh, posted that information on our mobile app, MySDMC, that same day on February 27th. The next day on Friday, February 28th, uh, we sent an email to all employees. The attachments to that email included CDC fact sheet uh, and also a flyer with the tips for fighting uh, the flu, prevention tips. Uh, and then uh, at the time we went home on that Friday, August 28th, um, as I said, we had communicated uh, with all our parents and employees, posted the information on our website. We went home that afternoon thinking that time was still on our side. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. That Sunday, March 1st, um, we got word uh, during the middle of the day that there were two presumptive cases uh, of coronavirus in the state of Florida. Uh, one was in Manatee County, a Manatee County resident, and one was in Hillsborough County. So, 
That very next morning, which was Monday, March 2nd, Superintendent Saunders went to Tampa and met with Governor Ron DeSantis, Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez, State Surgeon General Dr. Scott uh, Rifkes, uh, and they discussed the coronavirus and its impact on our area and region. In addition, other school district officials met that same day at the Emergency Operations Center here in Manatee County with the Florida Department of Health and other emergency management professionals to open lines of communication and decide how we would move forward as a community. Uh, it was also during that meeting at the EOC on March 2nd when we found out that the two presumptive cases were now confirmed. The very first confirmed case in the state of Florida was a Manatee County resident. So uh, since last Monday, March 2nd, uh, we've been providing regular updates. And again, I'll, I'll just show you on our, our website, we're keeping a log of the updates that we do. You can see, you can see you go down to the bottom. These are the updates that we started. Our first was on Friday the 28th. Uh, we had them on, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday of last week, and then again uh, yesterday. Uh, we actually had an update uh, today as well. That is the one that's on the website right now. Uh, but that's how we're keeping the public informed. And I just wanted to um, give you that part of the equation for how we're dealing with coronavirus. Uh, I'm now am going to invite to the podium. Uh, the health officer for the Florida Department of Health in Manatee County, Dr. Jennifer Bensey. So. so good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, Superintendent Saunders, and other leaders. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for inviting us to your meeting uh, as we move through this public health crisis together. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have already met um, with Superintendent Saunders. We've been speaking almost daily now. Uh, Dr. Hopes and Reverend Golden also um, uh, have been to our offices to discuss COVID-19 and its presence in our community. And I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, Mike Barber, Paul D'Amico, and Sally Hall uh, for having daily communication with us uh, and having been partners with us um, in all preparedness efforts uh, throughout the years. Um, as we move toward uh, this newest event. Um, as a result, we've started a daily process to notify the school system of any concerns regarding the status of school children and their families in the county. Uh, yesterday, Governor DeSantis did declare a general state of emergency due to COVID-19's presence in the state. By declaring this state of emergency, Governor DeSantis is ensuring that the state and local governments have the resources and flexibility they need to prepare and respond. The highest priority of both the governor and the Florida Department of Health at this time is to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ensure everyone who is potentially infected uh, is appropriately identified, cared for, and isolated. As Mike stated, in Manatee County, we currently have one confirmed case, meaning that uh, the person tested positive at both the state laboratory and the CDC laboratory, and also now one presumptive case, again, having tested positive at the state lab, and we're waiting results from the CDC lab. Manatee County Health Department staff are monitoring these two individuals, their families, their direct contacts, as well as individuals meeting the criteria related to international travel. And we've been doing that for um, the past approximately six weeks when um, those um, persons from particularly China were coming into the 11 um, airports in the country where the CDC quarantine stations are um, monitoring them and then um, notifying the states if any of those people met those criteria. The Florida Department of Health is actively involved in enhanced surveillance for respiratory illnesses that may be COVID-19. Manatee residents who believe they may have COVID-19 are asked to call the Manatee Health Line before they visit a hospital or other health care provider to minimize the spread of disease. In other words, we'll coordinate with the 
emergency room that they want to go to so we can call them ahead of time and they can prepare to put on their personal protective equipment and prepare their isolation rooms to minimize the spread of disease. The state also offers a 24-hour hotline, not only for those who believe they may have COVID-19 and they have questions, but also for general information. Everyone plays a part in lowering the impact within the Manatee community, teachers, students, parents, and our many community partners. We are working closely with Manatee Emergency Management and all of these partners to focus on areas including policy, hospitals, clinics, healthcare provider protocols, first responder protocols, planning, and of course, communication. Taking everyday preventive actions helps to impede the spread of the respiratory diseases such as COVID-19. Preventive measures include, as Mike told you, washing your hands thoroughly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, avoid touching your face, especially with unclean hands, coughing into the sleeve of your shirt or a tissue, getting a flu vaccination if you haven't already done so, to prevent flu and also boost your immune system. Avoid sharing food and drink utensils with others. Continue to eat healthy foods, exercise, and get adequate sleep. Students, staff, teachers with a fever should be excluded from school until they are fever free without medication for 24 hours. The Florida Department of Health plans to send a press release update daily to keep the public informed. The Health Department will continue to forward these press releases to the school system and other Manatee community partners. The Florida Department of Health in Manatee encourage our residents to stay informed on how to protect themselves from COVID-19, especially through the websites that you saw, including those from the CDC and the Department of Health. They offer a wealth of information related to this ever-changing public health crisis. So we encourage you to look at those often. Um, in your packets, we uh, provided some information, uh, again, general information on um, fighting the flu, similar to any other respiratory disease. The information about our hotline, which is available. We have six staff uh, ready to uh, assist anyone in the community who believe they may have COVID-19 and how to get them into the healthcare system appropriately. And then information at the bottom of that page, again, with the websites and the 24-7 hotline in Tallahassee at the Department of Health for any questions related to COVID-19. This information here just came off of the um, email this afternoon about four o'clock um, telling uh, the schools um, how to stay, stay safe uh, and practicing good hygiene, uh, considering uh, rearranging larger activities and gatherings, how to handle food properly. And again, can't emphasize enough, people staying home if they are sick. And I'll stop there for questions. Great. I may present um, the team who is here with me this evening. Chris Tittle is our communications director. Dr. Edward Hernandez is our clinical director. Dr. Carla McGill is our community liaison during <coughs> this event. We have an incident management team in place. It's been in place for the last six weeks. So we have uh, our staff dedicated uh, to this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, uh, presenter is Paul D'Amico. He's the chief safety and security officer for the school district. Um, just to update everybody real quick, they're, they're great. The health department calls me every morning, 8 o'clock, and we, um, we get the update if there's any concerns to any of our students or staff. Uh, so they're, they're really been great on that. And I have a lot of questions. We're actually in contact probably a few times a day, more than just morning. So, um, so they're great. And um, I'm also get, uh, attending conference calls with the CDC on Mondays and Wednesdays. And also, I'm getting weekly updates from the emergency management here at Man Manatee County. I work with Steve Litzauer regularly. Um, they also send out, the emergency management department sends out regular situation reports. They're really good, really thorough with updates in red, and um, we get those too every day. So, um, 
you know, that's that's about it for right now, and, and we're just keeping up on it. So I just wanted to update you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Wagner, are you still there? Mr. Wagner? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, it's now your turn. Mr. Wagner is the Deputy Superintendent for Business Services and Operations. So, uh, uh, Doug, if you could give us an update operations-wise. Very good. Yep. We want to share with you what we're doing. So, in regards to supply, uh, we have adequate supplies on hand at the Maskey Warehouse, such as hand towels, soap, trash bags, disposable gloves. Uh, once the coronavirus came to light, we immediately ordered alcohol-based hand sanitizer and dispensers, which has been sorted, divided into units uh, based on population at the school, delivered to the schools with the attention of the principals. So we just received over 1,000 units of one-liter refills also, with another 300 arriving next week. Besides hand sanitizer and gloves um, delivered to the schools, our schools are cleaning uh, using our Veriside product called Avastat D. Uh, this product is a premix and ready to apply to treat and disinfect a broad family of viruses, including coronavirus. The school custodians are working hard to utilize this product around all touch surfaces at the schools uh, multiple times a day, including doorknobs, handrails, keypads, tables, chairs, desks, uh, playground areas, and other areas that come in daily contact with human hands. Uh, besides the schools, our transportation team is also sanitizing the touch surfaces multiple times a day on our buses. And starting Friday and continuing over spring break, we are deep sanitizing our schools and sites. Our team has developed a checklist and a, a tracking system to utilize that we ensure that we've done all that we can do. Uh, in closing, now, this is a team effort, as you heard from uh, the other presenters, uh, with many, many people working hard uh, at the warehouse, purchasing, custodial, maintenance and operation, transportation, the schools. You know, everyone's chipping in to help. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Deputy Superintendent Janelle Zarati yost our superintendent, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Instructional Services. Good evening. As Mr. Wagner and others have stated, this is truly a team effort. And as we focus on the education of our students, we began with a district informational session during a principal's meeting where Superintendent Saunders, as well as the deputy superintendents, communicated with our principals throughout the district. We focused on sharing information, um, healthy habits, to make certain that we do not spread any illnesses throughout our schools, making sure that things are cleaned properly, as well as indicating that videos and flyers would be distributed frequently and encouraging our principals to certainly utilize those, sharing them with students and staff as appropriate. Beyond that, we will have a conference call tomorrow where we will continue to educate. So that was last Wednesday, and again this Wednesday we're providing another update as we make certain that our um, health challenge meets the needs of all. When I say educating, I mean the entire school community because by educating students and staff, we're also sending information home to parents in English as well as in Spanish. And many of those items posted on our website are in both languages as well. There is a flyer that's been prepared for um, schools. They are um, certainly um, duplicating it at this time. It is to be sent home no later than tomorrow. We want it to be received by our families no later than spring break. It's also going to be posted on the website. One of the things that it addresses, not only um, healthy habits, but certainly CDC travel warnings. And as we break for spring break, we feel that that is critical. We want to focus on China, Iran, Italy, South Korea, and inform folks that we are strictly abiding by those CDC travel warnings. If you travel to those countries, there is an expectation that you complete a mandatory 14-day self um, isolation. If you're traveling to Japan or on a cruise ship during the holidays, there is a CDC recommendation that you monitor your health for 14 days following your return to the United States. So we not ask not only families, but also our, our own employees 
to please make certain that we can keep everyone safe as we return to school after spring break. So that information is being shared. Um, school sponsored and district sponsored travel to high risk areas certainly are all being canceled if they are trips. Currently planned school sponsored trips out of state which are non-refundable for students and for employees may be allowed. We're considering those on a case by case basis and certainly parents have the right to make certain that their students re remain at home without any type of negative consequence if they choose to do that. Out of state travel which is refundable is also being reviewed on a case by case basis and district administra administration will authorize those trips as they become a little bit closer but we are planning now for the months ahead even through graduation in May. Until further notice, new out of county and out of state travel requiring air travel will not be approved except for emergency situations or mission critical trips. District is certainly proceeding with caution regarding in-state travel. None of our trips have been canceled at this time. However, we are not authorizing any trips to, for example, um, Disney or any type of theme parks at this time where there may be international visitors, large groups. We want to ensure the safety of our students and the staff that accompany them. Field trips in county, as I stated, no restrictions at this time. We're continuing to work with the Manatee Health Department and monitor any potential issues in our local community. We will regroup after we return from spring break to make certain that we are current on any cases or any changes in, in health and, and the crisis here within Manatee County. And we will adjust to make certain that students and staff remain healthy. Athletic events, which I'm sure concern many folks. Currently working with the Florida High School Athletic Association regarding regional and state athletic events. And we will proceed utilizing guidance and collaboration. We have designed and established for pre-K through grade 12 what we're calling instructional continuity e-learning plans. This is not just for this potential um, outbreak of coronavirus, but for any emergency, we have the ability to place instruction in the hands of our students electronically. We have devices, we can distribute to families at home, and we have hotspots that can become available for students. So Schoology, which is certainly our virtual learning um, environment, and a social networking service for K-12 school and higher education institution allows users access to, cre to access, create, manage, and share academic content. So depending upon what time of year it is, we can seek to share the most current information, for example, the middle of third quarter or fourth quarter, so that instruction is current time and can be shared with our students throughout the district. So we will continue to highlight and review that information. Our curriculum and instruction staff has worked diligently to make certain that everything is up to date. She, they've checked with the exceptional student education departments, pre-K, ESOL, and all involved to make sure that we can access technology and instruction for all of our learners. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Teresa Masterson, our school health specialist. Good evening. Just wanted to let you know that the school health nurses and our health education staff are, are the credentialed health practitioners in the district and are at every school in the district. And so I'm proud to report that we never stop teaching healthy habits but instead uh, we are increasing um, to teach the students and staff um, and families from the list that Dr. Bensey mentioned earlier and um, working collaboratively really with our principals to get into the classrooms, send out the videos from the health department um, and get on the morning newscasts um, to educate the um, the staff and students, all really in, in an effort to keep everybody calm. I'm very proud of our nurses, uh, keeping everybody calm and to um, 
not create anxiety in our students because they see and they hear everything that all of the big people are saying and doing around them. Um, and secondly, um, we are working really with our senior secretaries and our principals to monitor the supplies in our schools, uh, paper towels, uh, gloves, hand sanitizer now, um, and soap, soap and water, um, just to, uh, so that we know when we need to reorder supplies um, for the district, but it is a group effort. And so um, if you have any questions with regards to the school health, um, let me know. Next is uh, Nicole Cox, our Director of Exceptional Student Education. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, my job tonight is to talk to you a little bit about how to keep our students' stress and anxiety levels down as we go through this. Um, I wanted to bring some research-based information, so I've gone to the Child Mind Institute. If you're not familiar with them, they're an independent national nonprofit dedicated to transforming the lives of children and families who struggle with mental health disorders. The first one is um, <clears throat> don't be afraid to talk to your kids about the coronavirus. They, like Teresa said, they hear the big people talk, they get nervous. Sometimes as adults, we kind of like to just not get into big scary things, but our children really need to hear from us. They're gonna react the way that we do, and so they need to understand, they need to be informed and get fact-based information, and it's likely less scary coming from a parent than what they're hearing in the media or social media. Um, be developmentally appropriate. You don't have to volunteer too much information, but answer their questions, answer them at their level, and um, making sure that you're available to your child is really what matters. They need to know you're there. Take your cues from your child. Um, invite them to tell you the things that they've heard or the things that they scare them, and do the best you can to try to be prepared to answer those things. But again, you don't have to prompt the questions. Your goal is to avoid encouraging any frightening fantasies. Deal with your own anxiety. If you're feeling nervous, your children are gonna sense that from you and they're gonna feel more nervous too. So if you're feeling that way, try to take some time, calm down, get yourself together and then have those conversations with your children. Be reassuring when you talk to your children. It's helpful for them to understand how rare the coronavirus really is. Ultimately, the flu is much more common, but they hear these things and they're very scary. And you can stress to them that really children tend to have more mild symptoms. Focus on what you're doing to stay safe. Help your children to understand these washing in the hands and the coughing in your sleeves. These are the things that they can do. You empower your children to keep them safe. And then they understand better how to watch their own selves. Stick to your routines as much as possible. The more uncertainty in this time, the more anxiety and um, depression or fear your kids are gonna feel. So as much as you can, try to stay in your regular routines. If your school or daycare should happen to be closed, think of what you would do on summer vacation or, or spring break. Keep your meals at a regular time, your bedtime at a regular time. Anything you can do to maintain consistency will relieve anxiety. And finally, just keep talking. Keep those lanes of communication open to your children. Let them know if you don't have an answer right now, you can find out that answer and come back to them. Or if they hear things that they're scared about, they need to feel open and being able to come to you. So ultimately, the biggest thing is how we react is how our children are gonna react. So if we're calm and we help them to understand, they're more likely to be more calm and ready to move forward. Okay. Thank you. Nicole, I'm going to use those with uh, my boys, even though they're almost in their 30s. But, uh, <laughs> all right, our uh, last presenter, and I thank you for being so patient, is uh, uh, we wanted a principal's perspective, so we have Laura Campbell, principal of Terra Elementary. Good evening. I think the most important role that we serve as principals is to ensure that our community knows that safety and learning is the priority. Um, we face that every day in talking to our families and our staff and um, immediately taking the lead from the district. We contacted our SAC and our PTO members and held a meeting on Tuesday, uh, March 2nd, and took the lead from our parents. What is it that's going to make you feel confident that our students are safe? And so in those meetings, um, we assured them that our nurse had already visited all of our classrooms on Monday, um, letting them know how to handle, um, and we do it in a developmentally appropriate way. We, we teach our kids to dab and we cough into our 
um, sleeves. Um, we wash our hands for more than 10 seconds, so sometimes that may mean 20 seconds where you're gonna sing the ABCs, and, and all the way up until fifth grade. It's really important that our students know um, they're only 10, so we're expecting a lot out of them to keep themselves safe, um, and it's a joint effort. That's the most important thing that um, I think as a community that we have a shared responsibility and we're spreading, spreading that message. You as the students, you get to be a leader in this. You are in charge of keeping yourself healthy and keeping each other healthy. Um, in addition to that, um, our teachers, our office staff, support staff have been phenomenal in making sure our classrooms and our hallways, our common areas, um, several touch points across the campus. Um, even today, as uh, Mr. Wagner shared, we've had the deliveries of additional supplies Together we branched out, everything's hung, everything's ready. Flyers are in mailboxes for teachers to distribute tomorrow, they'll be going home. Um, just it's a very joint effort collectively to ensure that um, our community is aware, our students are aware, and that we're taking every precaution that we can um, as a school district. Uh, we shared educational videos um, with the students, which they in, have enjoyed. Um, some of them have some dance moves in, in them as well. Um, just to make some light of it, even though it is really important, um, again, as um, Mrs. Cox had shared, that we do need to be appropriate in what we share with our students, um, that it is important, but we can uh, do it in a way that's appropriate for them. Um, also, um, I would like to share our attendance has, um, at least at our school, I don't, I can't speak for all of our schools because um, I don't know their data, but looking at our data, our attendance has remained constant. Um, and our focus on teaching and learning and our assessments that we had scheduled for this week, everything has been seamless and our parents have done a great job of ensuring kids are in school and we have a continuation of our learning. So thank you for having us today. Are there any questions? Vice Chair Kennedy. Of course I do. Dr. Bensey, can I borrow your expertise for a moment? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> kind of along the, the, the information, and I'm just like the rest of us, I think, just kind of following along with um, local and mainstream or national media. But um, it seems to me, again, just following as a layperson, that the virus is affecting elderly Americans much, for, much more so than children or even really people under 40 or 50. Is that an accurate assessment? Yes, at this point in time, yes. There are more uh, persons over 60 and then especially over 80, and those with underlying medical conditions. Okay. And then, um, I don't want to like, you know, do a full-blown simulation here, but um, if we were, to, you know, a what if, if we were to have a child with a confirmed case, um, what would your recommendation be to the district on school closure? Would, you, would we have to monitor every student in the school? So what happens every day in public health, uh, including here at the Health Department of Manatee, is there are epidemiological investigations. So um, the, the team, the epi team, determines what uh, the issue is. Uh, in the past, we do, for example, um, a, a Legionella or a tuberculosis. You know, in this case, we would work with the state epidemiologists, the state uh, and, and federal partners at CDC to look at all the guidance as it relates to a new um, type of virus. But there are protocols that we follow um, in all types of epidemiological investigation. So you find out, as we have done with the, the two persons already in our community who are positive, we in interview them. Uh, and then we find out who um, they've been in contact with, who they live with, and then start the investigation. And then persons are determined to be high, medium, or low risk. And then the protocols follow suit as it relates to what type of isolation, um, you know, monitoring of temperature, all of that. And then um, they know how to contact us if, if they f feel they have signs and symptoms of the disease. And then we work with the healthcare system uh, to, to follow up and determine. So there's a whole process, for example, on airplanes, if someone just had flown in, the persons that were sitting around the person in this, in that particular seat. So it's a six foot um, exposure uh, distance, if you will. So there are protocols as it relates to that, if you know specifically where this person has been. And so we get from the last two weeks back um, for the individuals who were monitoring all the places that they've been and then determine again um, what type of risk it is and then if it's high risk we contact those sites and 
interview those people and they're part of the investigation, if you will. Thank you. I think that's one good thing we can talk to our kids about, our, the kids that are in our care, uh, one way or another, is that you know they really are not, I don't want to say they're out of risk, but um, children seem to be, I don't want to say resilient, but they're, they're not really being affected by this. And, and as uh, Dr. Hopes uh, discussed with us this week uh, in our office, the, the possibility that they're healthy carriers. A lot of people are carrying this. They said 80% of the population um, who, who get it will have mild symptoms. It's the 20% who we will see because they're having difficulty uh, breathing and fever, uh, and um, therefore those are the ones who are gonna get the initial focus. So as time goes on and the testing changes, and, and you probably heard a lot about the testing in the last uh, couple days, um, soon it may be a commercial uh, locale such as uh, LabCorp and Quest, and so that'll open up a lot of more information uh, and a lot of people will be positive but maybe not have the symptoms and so we'll be looking at what that looks like if we can have a vaccine in the next year uh, like we do for flu uh, hopefully the herd immunity will take over and then it'll become something that we um, may be routinely dealing with over time but manage it uh, like we do with other uh, infectious diseases so a, a lot of variables right now um, but the scientists are working diligently to try to uh, determine treatments. We don't have a treatment at this point in time, so we're treating symptoms um, as, as they appear, if you will. Okay. Thank you. Um, Reverend Golden. Thank you. Um, with respect to the information that is going out, for example, the information about the skew in terms of older people, can you share with us how we can hopefully get that kind of information. Uh, number one, to cut down on the panic and cut down on the rumors. I, I appreciate all of the process that is in place, but when you get right down to it, what I heard tonight is wash your hands, especially if you're over 60. I haven't seen the flyers, so I don't know whether they say that or not, but it would just seem to me that, that, that we need to figure out a way to get the information not from one set of professionals to another set, but how to get it, how to get that kid to go home and say, Mama, you need to, or, and this is more to the point that I'm really addressing, if, if you're being raised by your grandmother, or if you're being dealt with by older people, how, I want to know how we can help with that. And then coupled with that, I appreciate the uh, language being sent out in English and Spanish. Uh, is it problematic to try to get that in Haitian? Is that something that can be done? Or is that too difficult to try to accomplish? Absolutely not. We can do that, and we do that for many of uh, our. I think I've heard that we've got 22 languages that are spoken in this district, and I'm I'm just wanting to make sure that we get as much dispersion of the information as possible in as many languages. So those, those are the two things. I, I'm, I'm just um, not afraid. I'm enlightened now. The more you know, the less you are. You have to be afraid. And so I thank you uh, for taking the time to come and do this and help us because uh, we were, uh, this, this will be a big help. If we could just get the different languages and the flyers and more information about the virus, what to look for, uh, how 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 to how do you tell? I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to look at Kennedy and say, "Man, you you got it." Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, oh, you know, or. I'm saying, I'm saying it, but because sometimes, they, oh my goodness, <laughs> use your other arm. <laughs> but it's just, I think there's some common sense things that could be said in a lay in lay language that would be that would be really helpful, particularly to younger children. And what you've mentioned extremely important for those multi generational families living together because yes. they're already saying that for those who are 80 and over, you know. Stay home, 
um, don't be going out much unless you absolutely have to for now, you know, have, have uh, food brought to you, uh, you know, work with, with you know, younger neighbors. Uh, so it, it's just a lot of common sense. But even using some of the, the procedures that we use um, in, in our daily work and, you know, having a person at more of their, their room in the house and, and, uh, and trying to minimize any spread if someone is, comes home with any type of, of illness. Uh, so uh, please let us know how, if we can assist you there, and we'll be sending more information to Mike to share with the, the no, families. I'm, I'm asking you. I, we, we don't, I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to write it. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we are aware that everybody doesn't come from a nuclear family. Absolutely. And those are the those circumstances. And for our deputy superintendent of instruction, um, everybody doesn't have a computer. And so I want to know how we are preparing to, to make sure that no child who winds up having to stay home uh, is deprived of an opportunity to at least keep up uh, academically, even though they may not. Uh, are, we, are we loaning them? Are we get, how how does, do you just come and ask for it? How do we, how do we let people know? Um, when it's a one-by-one -one situation, we know that our um, administrators at the school level will inform principal. us. We okay. will communicate with the principal to determine if that child has access to technology. We have hotspots that we can loan them along with computers. We have uh, materials that we can send home as well, hard copies if appropriate. So we will meet the needs of our students on a case-by-case -case basis. And then if it becomes a larger... Um, need than we originally think, then we will certainly um, dispense computers. We have quite a few that we can loan to families, whether they have a computer on site or not. And as our IT um, director has indicated, instructional technology is only a click away, and we will make certain that we provide those technologies so that students can remain connected to the instruction. Lastly, we've heard a lot of precautions that have been taken in the schools, in the hallways, and in the places on campus. What is the specific protocol with respect to our bust students? And how are we making sure that even before they get to school that the environments on the buses are and I don't know if Mr. Wagner is still on the line, but the buses are um, being sanitized daily, twice a day. Mr. Wagner, are you there? Do you want to address that topic? I am. You're correct. The buses are uh, sanitized twice a day. Um, it's against the, the Department of Education Office of Transportation to have um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer on the bus. So that's why we're using the product that does uh, kill the virus uh, twice a day um, while the students are in, in, in the morning or after the end of the day run and then also midway through the day to ensure and then that's why we deployed the alcohol-based hand sanitizers out to the school so students could utilize that before they get on the bus. Are, are the bus, who's responsible for that, Mr. Wagner? Are the bus drivers or is it self-checked? I'm just, how does that work? Well, Mr. Sawyer is our director of transportation, who's in there uh, in the in the room right now, and and uh, he has a team that's deployed these measures, and and along with Mr. Hansen, our operations director, to ensure that we have adequate product. Uh, they've trained on how to utilize it, uh, and they're utilizing the the cleaning for their buses. Thank you, sir, and thank you. Uh, Dr. Hopes, do you have any questions? No, ma'am. I just would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Bensey and her team. Uh, they're doing an incredible job, and the the collaboration is is really what's going to make a difference. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I'd like to echo that as well. As a mom, and I have one little girl in our school that 
really hits home and I appreciate all that you guys are doing so thank you very much thank you may I make one additional comment very briefly yes. um, last week uh, the Florida Department of Health school health program audit occurred in Manatee County and I would just like to recognize Teresa Masterson and um, all of the nurses because um, at the end of the audit uh, at the exit interview we were told that um, it was the best self-assessment the auditors had ever seen and there were no corrective actions no need for a plan so kudos to everyone involved. Thank you. Now all y'all gonna get up and leave now like yeah. uh -huh. okay, okay. Thank you. Mr. Barber. introduce our next uh, presentation. Um, Michaela Balkins is a junior in the International Baccalaureate Program at Southeast High School. She is also the president and founder of Students United to Improve Race Relations. The student organization has developed a program named Mirrors and Windows that involves student volunteers, as I understand it, uh, reading racially, ethnically, and culturally diverse books to students in grades one through five. And as soon as we get Michaela set up, she's an IB student at Southeast. We should probably have her. We're, no, uh, we're working to get her presentation available so she can show this. So uh, would you guys? Uh, Madam Chair. We, we're not going to get anxious. I don't care. We're going we're gonna to see this tonight. <laughs> whenever, whenever it gets ready, you, I, thank you. Thank you, Madam Superintendent, and thank you all. But whatever, we can go ahead. I, it, whenever, you know. Would you like to move on to a little bit more business, and we'll come back as soon as we get this? We have one more report, so we'll see if we can get it. Yeah. Oh, yes, this is. This is the IT report, right? This is the IT report. No, he's just helping them get set up. Oh, he's helping them get set up. Oh. Hello, school board members. My name is Michaela Bolkins. Thank you so much for allowing us to present this evening. Uh, to first begin, I'd like to thank Reverend Golden for his um, talk during the coronavirus presentation about how to incorporate diverse um, measures to ensure that all students uh, know of precautions to take health-wise. I think that's incredibly important and we love the incorporation of a variety of languages and uh, we were very surprised to learn that there are 22 different languages um, spoken in this county area. So I only speak one. Let's <laughs> keep that in mind. That is okay. <laughs> Um, but the appeal to diversity is definitely appreciated on our behalf. And, um, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I was so moved by your letter that you wrote that, uh, and I, I don't mind saying this publicly, I, I wanted to make sure 
that everybody across the district knew that we had such a bright, bright person in our midst who was so sensitive and sensitized to the diversity that is coming here. I just thank you. And I thank you for graciously coming, even though this is not February. <laughs> Appreciate your being. Yes. <laughs> okay. Obviously, the February meeting would have been more fitting, uh, given that it was Black History Month. However, uh, it is March 10th, and we are here today. Right. And along with me, uh, we have Francis Garcia. He is uh, the vice president of our club, Sutier Students United to Improve Race Relations. And he is an 11th grader uh, at Southeast in the IB program. Amen. And uh, next to Francis is Mrs. Brittany Henry. She is a second grade teacher at Rowlett Academy, which is the school that we partnered with. Amen. And so um, in 2018, I founded a student organization called Students United to Improve Race Relations at my high school. My generation has witnessed the mass shootings in South Carolina and in El Paso, Texas, the shootings of Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin, and the right supremacist rallies in Charlottesville. Not to mention, I have classmates at Southeast who live in fear of being deported. Although Soutier was initially established as a safe space for students to talk about race, I wanted to ensure that our club could have an even wider community impact. I reached out to my elementary school principal, who used to be the principal of Wakeland Elementary, now Johnson K-8, through Dr. Fradley, to talk about an idea I had that incorporates diverse reading um, to kids. Um, so in mid-September of last fall, we kicked off our Mirrors and Windows program at Rowlett Academy. We believe diverse representation in children's books matters. In partnership with neighboring Rowlett Magnet Elementary School and Mrs. Brittany Henry, Southeast student volunteers read selected books to students in grades one to five on a daily basis from 3.30 to 4.30 in the Rowley's Nest after school program. Utilizing prompts that are designed to stimulate discussion, we encourage the students to ask questions about the story. Our project embraces the understanding that how students view the world will be different depending on who and where they are. We recognize that students need practice understanding multiple points of view. The stories we read to the, um, to the kids reflect their own identities, experiences, and motivations, their mirrors, what they see about themselves, and also provide insight into the identities, experiences, and motivations of others, windows. As the students find themselves in a text, they find themselves validated. I'm good, you can see this. So these are some pictures from our time at Rowlett. Uh, this is actually one of the first uh, mirrors and windows program pictures that we ever took. This is our first grade bunch. And um, we read Emmanuel's Dream, which was a book about a, um, a young Guinean um, biker who was actually disabled who <laughs> um, rode his bike across his country. Um, and these are very young kids, first graders, but it was amazing to hear the insight that they had and the questions that they asked about the book, but also to portray not only a person of color um, accomplishing his dream, but also someone who is disabled. So multiple forms of diversity in one book. Um, this here's another picture. This is a group of students from our high school, um, all 11th grade students, reading to uh, a group of second graders. They read a book, Whoosh, um, which is about a, um, a famous African-American inventor. I believe it is uh, Lonnie Johnson's Super Soaker. So it's a great way to appeal to kids, uh, talking about the Super Soaker machine gun that many of them played with. And the last picture is Francis, who's right here, um, reading a book called Not Quite Snow White. So students may grow up, especially young girls, uh, with this ideal that Snow White is like the perfect princess. But this book, Not Quite Snow White, taught kids that you don't quite have to be Snow White um, in her fair skin um, and curly black hair to be a princess. Um, and these are means by which we can locate diverse books. Um, we have an, there's an app that we did not develop. Uh, it was actually a Dartmouth student. Um, she developed We Read Too, which is a book to uh, an app to locate diverse books. And there's an array of diverse books on there. The tab that's been selected in this iPhone picture is picture books, which are the books that we've been reading at schools. And um, 
in the Mac um, computer, there is a website called We Need Diverse Books, which is actually a group that advocates for uh, diversity in books and also provides resources on where to find them. And now I'm going to come um, have both Francis and Mrs. Henry come up and talk about personal testimonials um, to the program and what students say. Hi, my name is Brittany Henry. I'm in my ninth year of teaching at Rowlett Academy in second grade. Um, it, it's funny, I wrote all of these things to share with you, but really Michaela just spoke just volumes to how important this program is at our school. Uh, being a teacher of color, uh, being one of the very few teachers of color um, at my school, it's not only powerful seeing it myself in these books, but to see um, just my boys and girls in my second grade classes and beyond, seeing them empowered and seeing the smiles on their faces when they know that the Sotir students are coming to our school um, each day, is it melts my heart as a teacher. And I really, really hope that all of the schools here in Manatee County can have that same opportunity when we continue to learn about students and other people that are different from us. Uh, that is when we truly grow within ourselves and we're able to respect each other's differences but also grow on the talents and uniqueness of really just everyone around us. So I'm super grateful for this program at our school. Um, it's an honor um, just to be able to be a part of the program and be the teacher representative as well. And then every single time I choose these diverse books, not only am I choosing uh, books that have little brown girls and brown boys, but I'm also making sure that I'm choosing lots of cultural diversity. Um, just the fact that our vocabulary is increasing. We have many students that never heard of a hijab. Um, and just the fact that they're seeing that and knowing that is okay to wear and um, just knowing that they can do all of those things um, as well is definitely something I want to continue and just continue to embrace um, across Manatee County Schools. So thank you for this opportunity and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna read first off uh, some of the drawings by some of the kids. Uh, let's see, we asked them um, about the program, their opinion, their thoughts, and there are some of them. So this one's by Lila Hilt. Because it is entertaining and fun to be read to and I love the, read, the reader leaders. And this one's by McKaylee and Kai. I like it when they ask questions about the book and they are always uh, super fun to read with. This next one is by McKinsey. I like it when you come read to us because we learn about different countries. It's so fun. Thanks for reading to, a, to us uh, and come again. And this last one is by Tia. I like people reading to me because there are always different stories and some stories haven't read yet. I haven't read yet. It makes me happy because some people can't read, but they are also learning new words. So I love to hear many different things. And just from my own experience, I uh, came as a member to the organization and I volunteered many times. And as a volunteer, it's great. You feel like a superstar just <laughs> coming in there and they're like, oh, it's Francis, it's Michaela. It's pretty awesome. Um, and like Michaela mentioned, it's not just about um, racial diversity, uh, but at times there's more than that. There's um, gender diversity, and if I can go back, uh, oh. it doesn't matter. Uh, the arrow. <laughs> yeah, all right, thank you. Oh. But let's see. Yeah, right over here. Uh, yeah, with Not Quite Snow White, uh, like today, uh, we just had a video published about two African American leaders at our school, at Southeast High School, just talking about their experience with Black History Month and, well, happy Harriet Tubman Day. Uh, but we love to feature uh, girls of color so that they can see themselves in the book. Uh, and there's even another book called Grace for President that they can even run for president. Um, we've had lots of success with the club at our school. We've been able to partner up with multiple organizations so that we have volunteers come in every day. Uh, we have up to three each day, and it works out perfectly. Uh, and right now, Michaela, okay, would you like to talk about expansion? Oh, yes. So if I can just look at this paper again. So the final note is um, 
more of an expansive sort of plans for the future note. Um, so initially we wanted to uh, request money directly from the school board to ensure that all schools in Manatee County could have a set of racially, ethnically, and culturally diverse books. However, we understand that the school board is dealing with other concerns, and so we would like to request the help of anyone in attendance in identifying organizations and lo uh, or local corporations that could be interested in making a gift. Um, here is the breakdown that we'd assume um, to be for each uh, of the elementary schools, given that there are 32 elementary schools in Manatee County, and um, we would allo allocate uh, 30 books per school. Each book costs approximately $15, which would add up to about $450 per school. Um, I am aware of the Manatee Educational Foundation and the Manatee Community Foundation, in addition to the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, um, but if anyone is aware of any other contacts, that would be greatly appreciated. <coughs> and furthermore, um, in addition to just the sets of books, we're also, uh, on a personal note, looking to expand our program to other schools. Currently, we're just at Rowlett Academy, but we're looking to go to uh, Samoset Elementary is right by Southeast High School. Uh, we're looking to expand. I actually live in the Lakewood Ranch area and uh, went to Nolan Middle School, so I know many people at Lakewood Ranch High School. We're looking to expand. Um, even over to like McNeil Elementary, Braden River Elementary area, um, so that we can have um, multiple sites of mirrors and windows with multiple different high schools throughout the county. Daughter, tell me your name again. Uh, Michaela Bulkins. I, I, I can never, you should, I wish your name Sue, or something an old person like me could remember. <laughs> no, no uh, I will not support in any shape, form, whatsoever, a volunteer effort. You will not leave out of here without, with my support, that you go out and ask somebody. I invited you here because I intend to fully support your request from the school board. Now, I don't know whether I'm going to get two other votes, <laughs> but I'm telling you that we are going to, this is just, this is just a wonderful, this this is why we serve. You are why we serve. You're the reason we put up with all of the negativity and all of the hostility and all of the, you're the reason because you're gonna make us all better. All from the board on down. And so I know I'm not going to ask you to go to the foundation to get what you need. They can add to this. So we'll have more than 15 books. So we'll have, they can add to this. But we, as a board, are gonna support you. I am, okay? I'm gonna do that. I, 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 I cannot have you come down here. This is, just, this is just a wonderful thing. And young man, I just, this is, you are a rock star. And I don't, yeah, you, you, I bet, I bet you can't play basketball, football, or any other, but you are a rock star because you're making so much more of a difference. And this sister here, they, 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 this is what you do in your spare time. You ain't, you ain't got nothing better. I, I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. We still have a lot, long, long agenda. And I don't quite know how to get this where I need it to go. Uh, whether I need to just ask the superintendant or the deputy superintendent. Ms. Shields to, will be in, in touch. She'll work with the administration from Southeast and and uh, work on a plan. So uh, Ms. Shields will, will be yeah. working with uh, Ms. Faison and so forth and work out a plan uh, at Southeast High School. So she'll be in touch with you. After spring break. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming. Hey, would it be really okay if really quickly I just pulled up our um, organization's website? Absolutely, that'd be great. Thank you so much. You mean after all of that, she had to figure out how to make the thing work? Where, where is this guy? We pay $500,000 a year. <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. So this is our um, organization's website. So of course the club is named Students United to Improve Race Relations. Um, but we go by the acronym SUTIR. So and if 
anyone in the audience is interested, uh, the hyperlink for the website, the URL, is sutir.org. It's that simple. We have a mirrors and windows page that features um, all of the stuff we're doing, and we constantly update it with pictures. And we also have our second semester reading list, which we're in right now, featured in addition to our first semester reading list. So that is the last thing I wanted to share, but thank you so much to the school board for letting us present, and thank you for your commitment to diversity. makes it all worthwhile. Job. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's make it all worthwhile. Hey, we have one more. <laughs> School internal funds audit report update. Do we have someone from MSL here? Yes. I'm Barbara Vetter, and I'm the vice chair of the audit committee. Um, Mary, the chair, is somewhere else at the moment. And I'd like to introduce Jeff Wolf from Morse, Stevens, and Lovelace. And they've been our external auditors for the last several years. And he's going to speak to you about the internal fund audit. Thank you. Um, it's a tough presentation to follow, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, First of all, I just want to thank the board for allowing us to continue to serve as your external auditors. Um, today I'm here just to report on the school, school internal funds. And I'm uh, moving right on to um, our reports issued. First on page one of the financial statements is our independent auditors report. That's really the report that states that your financial statements are fairly stated. Um, and for that report, it was an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion, you know, the best opinion you can, you can get. Next is the report on internal control and compliance on page 11. Um, we did have a material weakness reported this year, um, and that is the highest level for that report. And it really just comes down to the cash reconciliation process for the internal funds. Um, due to the difficulties with the PeopleSoft ER ERP system, um, the bank reconciliation process wasn't completed during the year, and the June 30 report wasn't completed until January 2020. Um, so this really caused the bookkeepers to have to kind of keep track manually of the cash balances. Um, and then in, this, in the, the report, uh, management's response is, is also included, which in, includes um, implementing a new system and also changing the processes um, relating to bank reconciliations. Um, the next report, which is separately issued, is a district management letter. Um, first is the district level recommendations. Um, we had no current year findings in the management report, and the prior year finding was cleared. Um, the next one is just a summary of findings by school, which is just, just an easy way to see, you know, the type of findings that are at the schools and the numbers. And then lastly is each school finding by school. And then another report that we've issued is just all the management letters that we issue to each school and their responses if they have findings. And lastly, I just want to point out, even though with the difficulties, the, um, the actual number of findings at the schools have continued to decrease significantly. Um, in 2017, there were 76 findings. 2018, there were 39. And this year, there was only 23. So um, 
at the school level, they are still continuing to improve and really to reduce those findings. But at this point, I'd answer any questions about the audit or our reports. Do you have any ranking of the severity of the findings? Uh, I know that you we, we, we list a number, but. Well, we list each type. Um, it's, it's a common one is not turning funds in within a day to the business. Uh, department or not getting deposited within five days um, and it's and each finding is listed by type and th the number of finding by type is all also listed in the report okay. are there any further questions dr. hopes are you still with us do you have any questions I I'm still with you and no I appreciate the report okay thank you so much thank you thank you Okay, so with that, let's move forward with new business. Um, we have a new business item, um, a non-consent item, and it's um, approval of school internal internal funds audit report as of June 30th, 2019, what um, we just heard about. And um, Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the school internal funds audit report as of June 30th, 2019. So moved. We've got a motion. Uh, I'll second and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, then let's move on to approval of the minutes. So move. Um, I don't oh, think the superintendent has given us a recommendation yet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the minutes from February 25th, 2020 regular meeting and February 27th, 2020 workshop. So moved. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the topic of approval of the minutes? Okay, hearing none. Uh, I'm going to call a vote. I haven't heard any, seen anyone hit move or second. Um, I know move we're move. having some technical difficulty, yeah. difficulties. Uh, I know I've seen Mr. Kennedy have to log in that a couple times. So, okay, now we've got our motion and our second on the board. Okay, great. Um, all those in favor, please signify by say, saying aye and hit your green button if you got one. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to the consent agenda madam superintendent do you have a recommendation yes i recommend uh, the approval of the consent agenda for march 10th 2020. okay uh, so moved okay i've got a motion second and a second uh is there public comment there is glenn did you want to mr Gibellina? excuse me I'll make this quick, quick, Glenn uh, for the record. So on the internships that are being, um, I think it's a great idea. I really like that. The only question I have is the transportation to and from the school to the different areas. And that, and I think that's a good idea. My question is when they get back to the school, because when I went to school and on the swim meet, I came back, all the buses were gone. How do the kids, if we're going to bring them back to the school, and I assume after school hours and the buses have left and they normally take the bus to school, how are they going to get back home? Has anybody figured that out? So the internship says we're going to take you there and bring you back, right? That's what it says in the contract. So if, if my daughter comes back and she used to take the bus at 3.30 and now it's gone, how are those kids going to get back if we were supposed to provide bus service? both ways just a question I don't know if you analyze it or not I see this this deer in the headlight look I don't know but uh, it's something you might want to consider I think it's, otherwise it's a great program and I'm glad Mixon's in there they're gonna get a lot of free orange juice man <laughs> okay thank you so much thank you Glenn for bringing that good question um, that is it for public comment on consent okay I've had a motion and a second um, although I think I need someone to hit the second button I think that was Reverend Golden yes Thank you very much. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, 
Let's move forward with new business. Uh, first is uh, approval of budget amendments for January 2020. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the budget amendments for January 2020. So moved. I've got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Is there any public comment? Until number five. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please. Okay, yes, I'm sorry. Um, no, thank you. Um, and Superintendent Saunders, this, this kind of loops back to the um, MSL report. Um, and if the, if the board agrees, um, if the board would like to do this, I would just like for us to get a, maybe an April date at one of our April meetings, just a um, kind of check in and update on the, um, where we on the process to, for the reconciliations issue to, to follow sure. up with that. Mm -hmm. If the board wants to. <laughs> I think that would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Put your green button if you got it. Uh, it looks like it passes unanimously. Okay, let's move on to item number two. That's uh, approval of the year-to-date financial statements through January 31st, 2020. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the year-to-date financial statements through January 31st, 2020. So moved. Second. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, let's move on to item number three, approval of job description and position of Executive Director of, of English Speakers of Other Languages, ESOL, uh, Exceptional Student Education, ESC, Federal Programs and Student Services. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the new job description and position of Executive Director of English Speakers of Other Languages, Exceptional Student Education, Federal Programs, and Student Services. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Uh, Vice Chair Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Um, Superintendent Saunders, I just wanted to um, just, t just f um, for my information, community information, I should have asked you this before, but um, uh, this is a this is a pretty um, this is a pretty high level position, obviously, for very important departments coming underneath. I'm just curious, um, is this um, like why, why the why, why the this new position and um, just curious what your thinking was behind it. Right, I, I appreciate you asking. Uh, we're reevaluating our org chart. Uh, in the past uh, few years, we did have a director of uh, school improvement. At that time when that was created, we had a number of DNF schools. Uh, we're seeing that we really probably don't need an isolated position there. So, uh, but one thing we do need is a director position should not be reporting directly to the deputy superintendent. And right now that is how the org chart is set all of these are reporting directly to Ms. Yost because the organization is really too large. Curriculum instruction and in the schools, you, you can't put all of those under one set person. So um, that is why we're kind of eliminating one set position and adding an elevated other, but then putting all of these under that org chart. So then all of the executive directors would then report to the deputy. Okay. And is this um, is your is your plan to this job would be filled July one for next July year? July one. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. I don't know if you remember, but Karen Carpenter, when she was on the board, always talked about how it really wasn't good business for someone to manage more than five people. It just really is not a good practice, and so I think that they're just trying to feed that. Yeah. So. Yeah, the needs are just a little different now than they were a few years ago. Okay. Fortunately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, and plus, this will give even more attention to these programs that I think really need as much support as possible. So I think that's wonderful. Okay, if there's no further discussion, uh, we're on approval of the job description uh, and position of executive director for ESOL, ESE, federal programs, and student services. 
Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to approval of new job description and position of IT site support services. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the new job description and position of information technology site support services manager. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none. I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, let's move on to item number five, a <clears throat> approval of the 2020-2021 and 2021-2022 academic calendar. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? I do, based on the <coughs> feedback provided from our website. I recommend the approval of draft A of the 2020-2021 academic calendar and draft A of the 2021-2022 academic calendar based on the feedback from the community. Do I have a motion? So moved. I've got a motion. Do I have a second? I will second it. Okay. <laughs> Not my first choice, but I'll second it. <laughs> Clearly, that uh, wasn't your first choice. Gina, we have some uh, public comment here, too. So. I know. Uh, oh, okay. I still need people to hit their motion and second buttons, please. And then uh, I know there's oh, public I'm, comment. Yeah, okay, thanks. So. Okay, uh, for, uh, we have three comments on the, uh, the, the two-year adoption or the adoption of a calendar for the next uh, two academic years. Uh, Adam Leroy, you're up first. Um, oh. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Heidi Leroy and I am an elementary school parent of two children who attend Louise R. Johnson School of International Studies, Vice Chair of SAC and a member of the Jewish Federation of Sarasota Manatee, Manatee's Community Relations Council. First, I wanna thank the school board members, Superintendent Saunders and the teachers in the room for your time and commitment to our children's education. I am speaking to you tonight as a Jewish parent and want to express how important the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are to Jewish families. While we appreciate that the holidays are recognized on the school calendar, testing and study review sessions are still held on those dates throughout the district. We do not want our children to have to choose between celebrating the most important holidays of our Jewish faith and their education. This is not a fair choice, but but is one that many students still struggle with every year. Last year, my daughter struggled with the same dilemma when benchmark testing was held during Yom Kippur. Many other students are challenged with this same situation, having to make up major exams or missing critical study sessions. While most teachers are respectful, without clear guidance, some are unintentionally not. In light of these challenges, we are requesting and suggesting religious accommodations for all religions. Specifically on behalf of Jewish families, we are asking for the district to do the following. One, adopt a district-wide policy that no benchmark testing occur during the high holidays. Two, strongly discourage holding exams and study sessions during the high holidays. Three, if, if exams are held during these high holidays, we request that the review session be available online and in a power, PowerPoint format. Four, request school administrators to take the Jewish high holidays into consideration when planning school-wide events such as picture day. And last, number five, encourage dialogue regarding religious accommodation requests between parents and teachers at the beginning of the school year. We believe that this could be super helpful with teacher planning. Over the past two decades, the local Jewish population has almost doubled and continues to increase exponentially. Other large counties in Florida have addressed this issue by closing for the first day of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. At this time, the, at this time a Jewish population may not be large enough to justify school closures, but as the population continues to increase, the number of absent students and teachers will too. We hope that by bringing this to your attention now and beginning to make changes, the district can transition smoothly to accommodate all religious observations of important holidays. 
Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to speak and again for your continued commitment to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Trudy Krams. Krams, did I say that right? Trudy. Okay. Um, oh, and that was Heidi. Okay, so uh, that, that was it. Ma'am, could you, could you say your name so we have it for the minutes? Yes, my name is Brittany Marks Renneberg. I'm a parent of four children, three of whom are in elementary schools in the district. And I am going to read a letter from the Chabad of Bradenton and Lakewood Ranch. Um, dear school board members, we thank you for taking the time um, in this important meeting to consider um, our calendar recommendations. We regret that we cannot be there today as it's the Jewish festival of Purim. We hope the letter is able to convey our thoughts. We are writing this as parents of a child in the Manatee School District. Our son attends Mona Jane Middle School and as Jewish community leaders in Lakewood Ranch. Mona Jane has been very accommodating with our son Zalman um, when he had to miss school during the high holidays and they were respectful of our culture and religious needs. Additionally, we have serviced the, we serviced the Jewish community in Manatee County for over 15 years through the Chabad of Bradenton and Lakewood Ranch, an organization dedicated to the spiritual and cultural, educational and social needs of our local Jewish community. Our annual high holiday services have grown commensurate with the Jewish population. We now hold high holiday services for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for hundreds of local res residents, including many children. As the Jewish population has evolved, the needs of the Jewish students in Manatee County has evolved as well. We have many students attending services and more would like to attend. However, many of them have a difficult time attending due to scheduled testing during the uh, mentioned holidays. Please consider the religious needs of these Jewish students with provisions for excused absences and no scheduled testing during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Doing so would promote their Jewish identity and help them foster a deeper connection with God. <clears throat> Providing students with a space to fulfill their sp spiritual needs can go a long way in enabling these impressionable children to grow to be moral and upstanding citizens. Thank you very much for your consideration in this matter, and may God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Is there any follow Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Madam Chair. Um, hold on. Vice Chair Kennedy first. He just raised his hand and then, then you. Oh, okay. Um, board colleagues, if you remember, I was, I was promoting version C the last time this came up. Um, and I was still, even when the agenda was published, uh, excuse me, I was still a proponent of version C. And then I got to the feedback from the public and from our teachers and a couple of things. Um, jumped out, the strongest of which was a, um, a, a I don't want to say criticism, but um, the strongest comments were about having school on Veterans Day. And in calendar B and calendar C, that was scheduled to be a school day. Um, we, talk, we as a board talked about it briefly when we published this for um, public input. Um, and the um, just kind of the nature of the, the passion in those comments. I, I know it's, they're just comments on a spreadsheet, but it really comes through loud and clear how important that is to some people. And that basically won me over. So I, I really, as a high school, former high school person, um, the imbalance in days between the first semester and second semester, um, you know, there's six more days in the second semester. So that's, uh, that's an issue. But I know our high school staff is professionals in the, and they'll deal with it. Um, but that really kind of won me over. The, the other, um, interesting comment that I read um, in uh, I think one or two people brought this up definitely one that I can think of think of right away but um, she wrote that she didn't think that we needed to have hurricane makeup days anymore 
Um, because we have the extended school, we have the extra half hour, thanks to the voters of Manatee County. Um, and that fulfilled our, our, um, our hours requirement. Um, so I, I just, I thought that was a really interesting comment. And, and we, you know, the, when we had the Hurricane Irma um, issue, you know, Sarasota County, because they had the ha extra half hour, they didn't do any makeup days. And so families and employees, well, why do we have to make them up if Sarasota's not making them up? And so I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, I, I have no problem with them being on the calendar just in case. Um, we do have some sort of extended uh, reason to be out of school, but um, I just, just wanted to bring that up to everybody because I thought that was an interesting comment from the public. Reverend Golden. Yes, before I consider withdrawing my motion, I'd like to know if it is true that no consideration was given with respect to the Jewish students who are part of the school system. Thank you. As a member of the calendar committee, Reverend Golden, that is incorrect. We had a parent who represented the Jewish faith that served on the committee. We did discuss Jewish holidays. We did discuss the ability to um, modify a benchmark calendar that would alleviate an, um, testing on those ho high holy days. However, if it is a state testing date, it's beyond our control. Those dates are set by the state of Florida, and we are unable to modify those dates. However, we did um, have discussion regarding those um, high holy days and how we could possibly accommodate families during the um, Rosh Hashanah as well as Yom Kippur. Within the discretion of the district, those days that are within the That is correct, yes, sir. Okay, so. We are accommodating our Jewish children uh, within the discretion that we have as a district. We are not able to change benchmark days we can't. because they are set by the state. We can change benchmark. We cannot change state testing dates. Okay. Benchmarks are flexible within our control. The dates that are in this calendar, are they our uh, Tested. Are they our benchmark dates or are they the testing dates? Okay. They are not. I'm sorry. This calendar represents the dates that the students will attend. It doesn't embed uh, the state testing or those items. Uh, what I will say is, uh, well, in some cases, some, some of those haven't even gone out yet. So we don't have everything defined. But these are the student dates that are in attendance. Uh, what the parent is asking, we don't have a clear guidance from the district across the board on the expectations of those high holy days. And uh, what we will do based on her recommendation is we will put something in writing so that we can make sure across the board on the areas that we do have latitude, we will modify. And if we cannot, what she's asking is that, that we at least convey and communicate to teachers and schools of the expectation of how to work with them so that students don't feel like they have to choose or they're penalized. So we do not have a formalized process in writing across the board that's uniform, and I believe that is what the parent is asking, and we definitely will put that into place. Uh, back to Mr. Kennedy's comment, the issue with the differential of the six days from the other, if you did have a hurricane, those six days do come into play because you are given uh, semester credits. So you have to do X number of hours per semester. So it, it, we do have a little bit of room because of the extra 30 minutes. It's not as much room because it's not even. If it were even, you're absolutely right. You would have some play. But you don't have as much latitude because it's not an even split of 90-90. So we still do need to leave those on the calendar. Madam Chair, I will, uh, I will leave my motion in place given the explanation that has been, been, been given. Mr. Miner, you signed up to speak. Uh, thank you, ma uh, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Board Member Golden uh, appreciates that if I uh, didn't vote for A, which um, 
provides for Veterans Day being a holiday that I make my honorable discharge from the Marine Corps subject to revocation. So, so, so thank you. I'm just want to explain a little part of my book. Okay? I appreciate that. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Reiner, for clarifying that for yeah. all of us. Um, Madam I Chair? Just, yeah. Yes, Dr. Hopes. Thank you. Um, first, to address the concern about state testing uh, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, pretty sure even if they suggested it, 25% of Florida's population live in Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade County, districts which have no school on the first day of Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur, that given the fact probably 50% of the state's Jewish population in those three counties, I don't think the state would get away with having state testing on those days. But I will, you know, ask uh, with, with all sincerity that, you know, given our children, you know, grew up in an Orthodox household, and many people may not realize that, that those days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, are the holiest days. They are days of no work. And on Yom Kippur, they are, it is a fasting day. So you are in synagogue on those three days. And on Yom Kippur, you fast for approximately 27 hours, and that includes no water either. Uh, that we have a district policy that there is no testing on those days in the district for any types of tests, and no activity which would disadvantage our Jewish children or not being at school, uh, and being in synagogue where they probably are and belong. Uh, and so I'm happy to work with, with Ms. Yost on that, but, but I would uh, ask that that be a district-wide uh, policy or protocol uh, regarding those high holidays when they fall on weekdays. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that most of the feedback I got was very much in support of A. Um, I think a lot of the feedback that I got was um, they didn't like weeks starting in the middle or ending in the middle, which I totally get if you're having to work with child care issues. That would be very difficult, so I can understand that. And the other thing I got, the other feedback I got was they felt like Christmas break was too long. So, and I, I suppose I can understand that one as well. <laughs> um, and Veterans Day was a big And Veterans Day, I think that was another really big one, which, um, so I, I really appreciate um, you uh, supporting A, even though I know you are an ardent supporter of C, but that is why I didn't want to put out there, well, the board supports C. You're right. Because you never know, you know, people have a different point of view, and I, I always appreciate hearing everyone's different point of view on that, because it makes you think differently about, you know, we see it from one way, but everyone sees it from a different way and I appreciate you guys you know I know that you guys make a testing calendar um, and we see we typically get to see you know the testing minutes and all the other things that, that, that does come before us mm -hmm. um, and if we need to create a policy I'd support that as well but um, I appreciate that you guys are working through that and that you had um, a wide variety of representatives on this committee that created these calendars so I really appreciate that thank you um, and with that, I see Mr. Kennedy, you hit your speaker button. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Oh, actually, well, um, I do, do just want to thank the committee because this is yeah. this is an impossible jigsaw puzzle to yeah. put together. Um, and, you know, we're a couple years ago, we were allowed by the legislature to move up the start of school, which enabled us to have uh, first semester exams before Christmas break. And now we can finish uh, by Memorial Day weekend. So, uh, but it's still getting... Plugging everything in is is really hard to is really hard to do, and the committee I think did a great job. And, and again, I appreciate the uh, the f uh, opportunity for feedback. It was it was very eye opening. So thanks for the process. It was good. Uh, and Reverend Golden. It's, I, I just want to be very clear that the two high holy days will become the subject of a policy that obviates the need for testing or book benchmark bookmarking benchmarking. That, then, okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of draft A for the 2020, 2021, and 2021, 2022 calendar, academic calendar years, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. 
Let's move on to item number six. Um, item number six is approval of revisions to audit committee charter. And that is our item. Um, and we really have um, two um, charters that have come before us. And Dr. Grusso has also come before us at the workshop to kind of talk about it. So I'm not sure the best way to move forward with this item in order to make sure we have everything covered. Um, perhaps we work our way through it and then see if we can develop a motion. With Madam that. Chair. Uh, sure. Yes, Dr. Hopes. I, on this issue, I would like to move that we table it. Uh, I'm not there. It's going to be a difficult conversation with me not being there. I think we we now have these documents in front of us. We can probably add it to the, the next workshop and spend 15 to 30 minutes on it and then approve it at the next board meeting. Second the motion. Okay. Uh, you have made that motion, and Reverend Golden has seconded the motion to table. Um, and just for Robert's rules of order, to table means that we must bring it back at the next meeting or it dies. Correct? Correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm fine with that as long as we have a, a, a meeting, we have a workshop in between now and the next board meeting. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm sure we can work that out or put it before that next meeting, perhaps. Um, can yeah. I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. We have a special meeting on the 24th, mm -hmm. which is the Tuesday mm -hmm. after spring break, because next yeah. week is spring break. Our regularly scheduled meeting is the first one in April. So I, I just need some clarification. Why, why, why don't I amend the motion? And I, I would like, I, I, my motion is to postpone this item uh, until the first regularly scheduled meeting in April. I believe that's the 14th. It is. Then that would be April 14th, Madam Chairman. Okay. So, um, Chairwoman, sorry. Uh, Dr. Hopes has amended his motion. Do you accept his amendments? But th does that require us to have a workshop before that, or is this just going to be on the 14th? Well, I suppose like we can that. discuss that and decide. Uh, his motion was to take was to postpone it for that Until meeting. The, that is his motion. Okay. Time yes. certain. Time certain. Time certain. Do, was. do we have a regular uh, workshop scheduled in between that uh, today and, and that date? Not, not precisely, but we can we add will. one to before. We're going before that to meeting. on the capital plan. Remember, we're gonna the okay. one we do around that time. We're gonna talk about our five-year capital plan. Sure. So I, we could put that on that workshop date. We haven't set the date, but we could. Okay, so right. we can work to have a workshop before that. That would be fine. Thank you. No, second. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you you approve yeah. his amendments? Yes. Okay. So Dr. Hopes has uh, made a motion to postpone this to the April 14th. 14th meeting with the understanding that there will be another workshop about the audit committee charter. Six, Is there any further discussion? Chair. Vice Chair Kennedy. Thank you. Um, I would just ask, um, for the sake of simplification, and I think uh, Dr. Bruce is not here, but yeah. I want to thank her for um, just crystallizing this very eloquently uh, during public comment. That that really, um, there's really just two issues we have to deal with. This mm -hmm. will literally be the sixth time we workshop this charter, um, and I would ask the board: Could we just work from the the copy dated July 23, 2019, um, so we're all on the same page? We can come in. Um, because as she alluded to, there are some items on the, the copy dated June 12th that, um, that are missing, that are in the 23rd copy, um, but are not on the 12th. So I would just ask the board, can we I'm focus on the that. July 23rd um, version of the document and get rid of the, get rid of the June 12th version? And, and not only that, the July 23rd one, I, I believe, was approved by the audit committee. I think that yes. they were in support Correct. of that one. They've yes. already discussed that one. So I think if we were going to operate from one, I would think that we would need to operate from that one. So I 100% agree with that. Okay, so we have a motion to postpone. Um, is there any further discussion? All right, we're going to talk about this later anyway. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, aye. Any opposed? All right. So then let's move on to item number seven. 
Uh, that is also a board item. Uh, it was brought forward by Mr. Miner. Um, would you like to make a motion or would you rather we discuss is, it? And is get there to any the public motion? comment? Smith? Yes, there is. Oh, okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we still need a motion and a second for. Before we discuss it, and before we have public comment, we usually have a motion and a second. I thought that went first when an item came up, the public comment. Whenever there's an item, the superintendent recommends it. There's a motion and a second, and then we have public comment because right now there's no motion on the table to discuss, to have public comment on. Okay. I, I move to uh, uh, approve item number seven. Item number seven is approval of contract provisions regarding clean energy for the proposed new SUG Middle School. Would you like me to read all three of those proposals into the record for you, or are you? would you like to read them? I, I'll go ahead and read them. Okay. okay. Uh, there's, uh, this is a motion to approve three provisions uh, proposed uh, to be added to contracts regarding the new SUG Middle School construction. One provision that any contract concerning architecture and, and engineering services for design, as well as any contract for the school's construction, call for building EUI, the energy use intensity, the energy used per square foot per year of 25 or less, and an air tightness of 0.25 CFM slash SF or less cubic feet per minute of air intrusion or loss divided by building square footage. Two, provision that there be provided a building automation system to monitor indoor air quality temperature and room occupancy and a two-way electric service meter to monitor energy usage and energy produced. Three, that the design and construction contracts are subject to review and approval by an independent construction slash architect engineering energy efficiency auditor for compliance with the above provisions. Okay, Mr. Miner has made a motion. Is there a second? Um, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, are you seconding the motion? I, 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 am, I am prepared a second, but I want to ask the, the maker of the motion if he would consider a modification. Uh, and, and Mr. Minor, I, I, I appreciate the approach you're taking. And I, after hearing the speakers earlier, and with the knowledge that I have in doing the, the background work with regards to how we got to the Mona Jane design, and after discovering that that design has been built numerous times, and with the knowledge that the next school we build, the next school we need in the district will be, in fact, a middle school after the Suggs replacement, I think it's time that this district Given the fact that the, the, the bid on the architectural design contract is basically the same fee that we would be spending if we designed an entirely new building for the district, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm not so sure about the specifics in this, but I think that we need to, to basically put out a, a – a procurement to design the new design for an energy efficient middle school for Manatee County, a design that we will own that will be designed to not only the current standards for energy efficiency, including renewable energy sources, that we will then use as our own prototype to build the next middle school after this one, which will probably be someplace in the northeast part of the county. So with that understanding, um, I would, would, would second the motion, but I would also request 
uh, Eric Salagia, that is the uh, CEO of Florida Power and Light, who's now on the Board of Governors, that that as part of this engin- architect and engineering design for the new prototype for a middle school in Manatee County, that we include the engineering team from Florida Power and Light. And so with, with that, and I'm not sure how we word that, uh, rather than these detail specifics, but to redesign to design a prototype specifically for Manatee County for a middle school building that is energy efficient and incorporates, uh, you know, renewable energy sources and sustainable sources uh, in the design as feasible. Uh, with that, Mr. Miner, if we can have that understanding, I will second your motion. <clears throat> I'm not sure that was seconding the motion as it exists. It sounds no, I, I like would, we're trying to alter it to perhaps make this into generalities and an RFQ instead. Am I understanding you? More of like a guideline to put into an RFQ. No. Uh, correct. That we design no. a, an energy efficient prototype specific for Manatee County for a middle school facility that incorporates state-of-the-art energy efficiencies and renewable energy sources to the extent feasible uh, for a prototype that the design will be owned by the School Board of Manatee County. It, it does not sound as if the mover is accepting those changes to the motion. Okay, well then I won't second. Is there a second to the motion as it stands, which is these three provisions that are attached to our agenda being added as contract provisions to the proposed new SUG middle school? I'll second it for the sake of discussion, because I do think there's some details that we have to hash out a little bit. Okay, before we hash out those details, it has been uh, a motion and a second. Let's move on to public comment. All right, Um, Glenn, you're up first. For the record, Glenn Jibalina. Um I appreciate Dr. Hope's uh, comment on that, and uh, I would I would go along with most of it, with the exception of having FPNL on the on the board. They're they're in the business to sell energy. That's their business. You know, the CEO makes you know twenty million dollars a year, so I'm not too crazy about that. I think that uh, absolutely we need to own the design. Uh, I run in this all the time uh, with draftsmen that just duplicate plans and they want their end. Uh, if we have in-house construction and we have in-house contractors and lead certified specialists already in-house, there's no reason we can't own those plans uh, uh, for, f- for future schools. I mean, the, the architects just rubber stamping the stamps and uh, going through the motion and getting a big fat fee. You know, he made it the first time around. And if he's not willing to negotiate a downward uh, uh, pay, then we don't need him. Just, just let's do our own. And that's the way that should do. Uh, this, this needs to set the bar for all the schools. And, and by the way, I did, I did talk to Swift out there, and I had brought this up. They're on board. They have no problem meeting this. Nobody's ever instructed them to do it. So that's why we're at 55. But we could easily meet this with Mr. Miner's proposal and tighten up some of the, uh, the, uh, the air losses on that. They've got a good product. They know what they're doing. But nobody has ever asked them to meet these standards. And they could easily do that. So I think we will set the bar with this from this point forward, not only for middle schools, but for every school. And they have no problem putting in a, a uh, renewable energy component. But guess what? Nobody ever asked them. Because they're directed by the architect and the building department. That's who they answer to. So we need to redirect our, our, our focus and say, okay, we do want this, and you can do it. And you need to instruct the building department not to to add a renewable component to every new school and every retrofit school. You know, the 
The tail's been wagging a dog far too long as far as I'm concerned. And I think this board needs to take a stance, and this is an outstanding stance that we need to do on this. So I applaud you, Mr. Miner, for all the hard work. Exceptional uh, meeting yesterday. And again, Swift is on board. They just need to be withhold, and I think it would enhance uh, their performance as well. I've, I've, I have toured Swift. They're renewable. They're a, they're a model, so they have no problem doing that. Thank you for all your hard work. Thanks, Glenn. Mr. Kirching? Don, did I say your last name correctly? You did. Oh, okay. Just like the old singer, huh? Okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Don Croce. I'm a relatively new member to our county. Uh, just been here a couple of years. My wife and I moved here when we became empty nesters. Um, I love being a dad, helping my kids find their passion and their role in the world. Uh, in fact, I like it so much I became a mentor with Take Stock in Children. And uh, I meet with a junior in high school here uh, every week. Uh, through that program, I met Jim Willard and Jim is, and I now volunteer with Manatee Clean Energy Alliance as well. I volunteer my time for these efforts not just because of passion, but because both of these issues, children and climate change, need leaders to advocate for them. Climate change is happening whether we choose to plan for it or not. Beyond the political headlines, large investment firms are starting to pull out of fossil fuel investments. FPL even is building a huge solar farm, as you know. Credit agencies are looking at impacts of climate change on state and county finances and are putting a price to those impacts. Moody's assessment ranked Manatee County as the most at-risk county in the nation, in the nation, in terms of financial impacts of climate change. Even our county's government website says, since the adoption of the comprehensive plan in 1989, climate change has become an existential threat to Floridians and the citizens of Manatee County. And they've joined a coalition of local governments, the Tampa, Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition, to start planning mitigation and adaption strategies to minimize the impact of climate change on our communities. So I'm here to advocate for climate change and our children. Both will be impacted by your decisions, not just for tonight, but at every issue you face going forward. Now, you have a lot of issues going forward, I know, and these are not easy ones. You know, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made, but from a voter's point of view, you know, you're our leaders, okay? So we're looking to you to look out for our children's future as you do on all the decisions you make. But look out for our county's future too. Your vote tonight is a small but important step. You're being asked to approve some building provisions, provisions that another county has implemented and said is very doable. Your construction team even has said it's very doable. Leaders with passion say it's, it's doable. So please, approve the three provi provisions proposed to be added to contracts regarding new SUG Middle School construction, and seriously look at any opportunity we could improve our uh, renewable energy abilities in our school districts. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to, to speak to you. My name is Susan Derevec. I'm a retired teacher from Manatee County Schools. I was not a science teacher, but after hearing about global warming and climate change, I decided to learn what was going on. I quickly found that our increased heat was not from a normal fluctuation in temperatures, but as, it, as, has, as has happened in the Earth's past. Instead, this was a warming that was due to gases that we were putting into the atmosphere as we burned all sorts of fossil fuels. And I appreciate that burning fossil fuels has brought everyone inexpensive power, which has helped America become the developed country that it is today. However, now we're finding that there's a penalty to pay for putting all that pollution into the atmosphere, just as we've been penalized or found a penalty to pay for putting pollution into streams in recent years. I spend time now asking members of Congress to pass legislation that will require us to stop polluting through burning fossil fuels. This will happen because it will become too expensive to ignore the storms of our changing climate, expensive in lives lost and personal property and businesses destroyed. National legislation will be in some form of a rising fee 
on the purchase of fossil fuels. So now is the time to plan to make Sug Middle School and future schools both energy efficient and solar panel ready. So I too heard the discussion yesterday about the school in Osceola County and found that it was, it was an amazing presentation and something that is entirely doable for us. I would like to see our schools continue in this way. I remain in the county as a retired educator. I'm president of the Manatee County Retired Educators Association. And I know that I have the support of other retired educators in the county for us to do this for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've had a motion and a second. We've had public comment. Is there any discussion on this topic? I mean, Mr. Miner, you made the motion. Would you like to start us off? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is the moment for this school district for this community, you know, to show the world that we're leaders, we're concerned, and we realize uh, the urgency of a community and this school district taking positive action to combat <coughs> climate change. These three uh, procedures, that provisions that I have moved that we approve are not going to change the world overnight, but it will provide a signal uh, to our community that we care. We care about the barrier islands. We care about Manatee uh, County, which is most vulnerable you know, to climate change. Climate change is where the temperature in our atmosphere affects what goes, how much water is produced in the oceans and the Gulf of Mexico. And it's, it uh, causes the uh, Greenland to break up, and it's breaking up quite a bit. And Antarctica breaking up, and the water levels rise. And I attended a, a conference at State uh, College of Florida, where one of the speakers yesterday also spoke. And it really scared me. It scared me in a rational way, that if we do not take action, you know, we better start taking our scuba diving lectures uh, lessons for because we'll be scuba diving in our now front yards in about 20 years and it's very serious I'm asking my fellow board members to take it as seriously as I feel about this what this proposal is is kind of simple in s several ways it's asking for the first time to my knowledge to include in construction contracts design and engineering certain uh, reasonable standards of energy efficiency. Why haven't we done it in the past? Why wasn't it in the schools that we just opened this past year? Well, we weren't thinking about it that much, but we're thinking about it now. And it's time, at least for Sug Middle School, and this motion is only for Sug Middle School, to have these reasonable standards, reasonable standards that the, the uh, contractors say, yes, these are doable. We can make this. Reasonable standards that the speakers yesterday, the experts about this say, they're very reasonable. And it's not just uh, for the future survival of our area, but it's also for being energy efficient in terms of money that we as a community pay for energy. By having you know, these improvements or requirements, not, not specific, but at goals, uh, in our construction, uh, we will be making uh, money, saving money in the long run about the operation of our schools. I don't say that be blindly, but those who attended and those that were, who have watched it on TV <laughs> realized that the school that was open up in Kissimmee, you know, about a year ago, you know, is now generating enough extra, uh, of energy to you know, actually uh, pay, uh, make money you know, for the schools and that their payback from the extra cost of making it an energy efficient, uh, self-sufficient school will be pay back in five years the cost of having solar panels and the uh, tightness of construction they had. That's a heck of a deal that our community desires. Our community deserves, our children and the future of this county deserves. It's pretty simple, 
but it's very long lasting and it's very absolutely essential you know, for the survival that we set the pattern not only for ourselves in other uh, constructions. And this, you might say, well, this is a test, just like uh, the high school up in um, Kissimmee you know, was a test. Their test was so successful. Mark uh, Clint, uh, who was here, who's probably the most authoritative person in the state of Florida, because he's the facility director, that means for all abilities, all the buildings in Osceola County. Uh, you know, they're moving into making what they learned from Neo City High School into their other schools. They wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't successful. They wouldn't be doing it if they didn't know it was good for climate, for the citizens of Osceola, and I wouldn't be advocating it if I didn't, I wasn't totally convinced it was good for all the citizens of Manatee County. And this is the moment. This is the moment for our board tonight to say, yes, we are concerned, and we are going forward with reasonable standards into that uh, are put into the contracts uh, for uh, the construction, the uh, architecture, and the engineering. It's not a high requirement, but it's a reasonable requirement, and something that we can, you know, uh, after a year, we'll say, boy, we should have been doing this years ago, and we're, so, we're certainly glad you know, tonight uh, we did that. And so I'm, I'm asking my fellow board members you know, to join with me in approving this so that uh, we are moving forward, will be, we'll be a model you know, for other government institutions and private institutions, uh, not only in Manatee County, but on the Gulf Coast, that we need to have join us to avoid you know, the, losing these barrier islands and its counties along the Gulf Coast. I sincerely believe that. I believe that Tim Rutledge, who's a professor at um, Ringling School of uh, uh, Art and Design, who was one of the speakers, uh, was talking about the uh, urgency um, y yesterday right here in this auditorium. I believe Mark uh, Clinch, who came down here uh, for uh, from Osceola, uh, and he didn't come down here because he likes to drive I-4. He came down here for us, for us. It was a gift, his knowledge, his concern. We should accept it gratefully. We should act on it uh, and responsibly and approve this tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, I'm uh, vice, okay, Dr. Hopes, go for it. Yeah, uh, Mr. Miner and Mr. Kennedy, um, I'm. I believe I'm going to support this motion, but here's here's what I would ask, and I don't know whether we we tweak this. My my big concern is I don't know enough to know whether these statistics are appropriate. That kind of follow my train of thought, which is very hard from where I am. But I've I've learned much more about the University of Central Florida than I thought I ever would, and maybe it's because I'm sitting in between two UCF grads on the diet. But the University of Central Florida has the Florida Solar Energy Center, uh, which, among other things, has done some significant work around energy efficiency in schools for both the Florida Department of Education, the Florida Energy Office, and the National Association of State Energy Officers. And what I would like and forget about the bad utility that, that I mentioned before. What, what I would like in supporting this amendment, this, this motion, is that as a board, the five of us and whoever from the administration would like to go, that we go to the University of Central Florida and we visit with the researchers at the Florida Solar Energy Center, those researchers that have spent a tremendous amount of time in looking at how we can design and build energy efficient schools in Florida, and that after we have that, that uh, sort of field trip and we learn more about it, that if there's any modifications to this, we can. But my goal, my goal is not to rebuild Mona Jane for SUG. My goal is to design from the bottom up <coughs> the most energy efficient school that we can design in Manatee County that is with that that meets the program that we want at that school and i will support 
sustainable energy and clean energy, but I would I would like to know that if we learn even more about how to improve these requirements upon spending time at, at UCF's Florida Solar Energy Center about the work they're doing around energy efficient schools, that we could come back and amend this before we send out the procurement for the design of this replacement for SUGS. And you're welcome to take a few minutes and go out on the website for the Florida Solar Energy Center and look at the work that they're doing. But I think it would be beneficial for us uh, because I'm I, I'm uncomfortable rebuilding Mona Jane for SUGS because I don't think it's a state-of-the-art energy-efficient design to begin with, which is probably why it took so much solar to even meet half of the energy needs. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Kennedy. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I fully concur with Mr. Minor and our public commenters. I don't need to repeat, you know, I, I will just stick to new stuff, but I do want to express my support for this effort and between Mr. Minor and the community. Um, and I, I too, I think like Mr. Minor or like Mr. Uh, Dr. Hopes have kind of a detailed question, and, but I think we can all get to where we want to be um, regardless. And one of the things that we talked about at the workshop is that we wanted to kind of unstick all these construction projects that are, that are currently stuck, SUG Middle School being one of them. And um, Mr. Miner, I know you said this is only for SUG. This is not for any ongoing district guidelines, although I think that's probably our next step. Um, and that would certainly make sense. And I would, and I would support that too. Um, but and part of this has to do with timing because next week is, is spring break, so district staff will not be around. So um, we, we have this meeting on the 24th with the CAFR, so I, I think we want to look at a way, and Mr. Miner, you, you don't have a time sensitive necessarily in your motion, and I guess where I'm getting at is, is there a way, can we find a way to get the ball rolling on the SUG project so we don't lose this summer and then do an amendment because as you heard will smith was here today and they said we can't really even estimate costs right now because we haven't put it out to subcontractors let me finish let me finish um we haven't put it out there yet so is there a way and this is my question is there a way that we can get the ball rolling on the sub middle school project and then come back in a month or two or i don't know what the time frame is i'm not a construction person but implement because it will be it it is in this motion that this school will have these requirements and it will be audited to, audited to ensure that. So I just, my concern is with the delay, we're gonna lose an entire year of SUG um, because we can't get any work done over the, over the summertime. I think we can do both, but I, um, I'll defer Madam to the Chair. Superintendent and construction. Uh, Dr. Hopes? Yeah, I, Mr. Kennedy, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna lose uh, a tremendous amount of time with SUG. That's, that school's not going to, you know, if we started today, it's still going to be two years before that thing is built. Uh, so regardless of the summer, I mean, we're talking about a $58 million project. I think it needs to be designed right. And, and I, don't, I don't think sticking these requirements into a, a, a design that's at least 15 years old, which is what I've discovered, uh, is going to do it. I think, I think we need to, and I don't think it's going to take that long. I think I think we need to design an energy efficient school for the sub replacement. And you know, Willow Smith is talking about, oh, we haven't put out subcon, we haven't put out bids for subcontractors. They're planning on building the same school that 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 that, that they built, which is now known Mona Jane, which is built from a prior prototype, which is built from a prior prototype in Pendleton County and another county. It's not an efficient design. And so I think we do. I agree with Mr. Miner, I, and I think we need to set the standard for the entire district. We should not be building outdated designs. That's why we have the most, one of the highest energy consumptions of any school district in this state. And I, I now agree. I never thought I'd be saying this, but it's, it's time we change. And, and the things that I have been looking at recently with a new lens about what we can be doing and how we can better be spending this money, and, and there, are, there are other centers 
but I just became aware that UCF, the Florida Solar Energy Center, has been doing work specifically in education and for our own Department of Education to address ways we need to change in the way we build these schools to ensure they're energy efficient, and we incorporate sustainable energy. And so I don't think we need to be thinking about losing a month or two on replacing this facility, because in a few years after we build the replacement for SUGS, we're going to need to build another middle school in the northeast part of the county. So we might as well get it right now. You, you have been talking about solar energy since I've been on the school board. And, and I think that now is the time that we look at not only energy sources today, but anticipate continued energy efficiencies in the future. And we have a state university that's, you know, less than two hours away, and we can go meet with experts, and we can incorporate their research into this new design. We can go ahead and put out, put out the procurement to, to engage an architect, not to, not to build – a, a, a build Mona Jane on the Suggs campus, but an architect who will design an energy efficient prototype for Manatee County for at least the next two middle schools that we're going to be building. So I don't think we should be worried about the timing of this because, oh my gosh, we might lose the, the summer uh, with regards to Sug. Sug is going to get a replacement facility. They should get the most state of the art energy efficient facility, including renewable energy sources. Uh, and, and, and that's where I would like to go with this. I, I'm, I'm adamant about it. I, I do not want to build a replica of Mona Jane for SUG. I want to build a state-of-the-art, energy-efficient school that can be the model for the state of Florida. But, Mr. Miner, it's got to have a cafeteria. We've got to be able to cook meals and stuff like that. So it may not be the same as the one in Osceola. But I'll tell you what, it will be the school that all other districts aspire to build. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Reverend Golden. The, um, the agenda asks that we consider approval of three contract provisions for the Sug Middle School contract. That's what's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. The three provisions, uh, Mr. Attorney, that we have before us, um, in my mind, say that we are asking that the design call for a building energy use intensity of 25 or less at this school and an air tightness of 0.25 cubic feet per meter per square foot or less. The second provision is that there will be a building automation system at this school. Okay, and a two-way electric service meter to monitor energy usage and energy. The third provision says that, that these two provisions, one and two, will be subject to review for compliance, the first two, by an independent construction architect engineering energy efficiency audit. Does this say any more than that? I want, I want to ask the paid attorney. <laughs> we got this law firm going here, uh, but we're going to ask the attorney to die. Mr. Does this I say any more than this? I, I agree with how you understand it. All right. Then um, I will support this agenda item uh, because in spite of how hard we try to add and to give everybody our opinions about what we think. I remember when ethanol was going to solve all of our energy problems. It's funny now, but I remember when 10% ethanol and gasoline was going to do all kind of magic things, and all it did was drive up the cost of oil. And now we are sitting here still dealing with an energy crisis. I'm, I don't know, and I, I wish I, I do not know what it will take to make an energy efficient school in Manatee County that is energy efficient and cost effective. 
that has not been analyzed. Now, I've heard everybody's opinion. I've probably got one myself, but it has not been analyzed by the people that we just heard earlier today who are very good, very competent, very able to do that analysis. So until that analysis is done and presented to us, I'm not quite so sure me going to school and uh, for an afternoon and taking two hours to do it, that's four hours, two hours there and two hours. For me going to school to learn what I'm gonna learn on a field trip is gonna answer the question of how do we serve the people in Manatee County by building energy efficient and cost effective schools. That's hard work. And we're not, and, and that's not what this does. And I take uh, Attorney Minor at his word. And he's not trying to do any end around. He's not trying to do any run over. He's not trying to be subtle. He wants these three things in this contract, which says that's a step in the right direction. I haven't heard anybody say this won't do what it says it will do or this can't be done, or this is too expensive to be done. I haven't heard anybody say it. We've been talking all afternoon. All we have to decide is, are we going to add these three provisions for this school tonight? And I say yes. OK, we've gone around, and I have not had an opportunity to speak. I didn't get to speak at the workshop because we ran out of time. So um, I did watch the presentation yesterday. Um, and I gained a lot of information from watching that. One thing that he made very clear was that that school was, was designed with these, these things and other things in mind. He described it as a highly customized building to achieve what he wanted to achieve. He discussed that the most important factors was the design of the building to achieve these things. And today, during the workshop, when we asked um, some construction experts if this is feasible, the answer was yes. But if you listened more deeply to what they said, they said, yes, the ad is possible by adding solar panels, not by fixing the building, not by doing any of the airtight things that Mr. Clinch showed pictures of yesterday, of the airtight items and those other things, that's not what I heard today in the workshop. What I heard in the workshop was, yes, we can add solar panels and that will reduce this number and that's how you're gonna get this number in this building. That is what I heard. So to me, I don't think that even achieves what I think you want to achieve. If the board wants to truly and genuinely achieve these things, then it's not going to be able to take a building that already exists, a plan that already exists, and slap a couple rules on it and say, there, we did it. That's not what Osceola County did. Listening to him, it was very clear that's not what they did. They very thoughtfully and methodically put out an RFQ and he even gave his requirements in his RFQ as part of his presentation. But that's not what this is. This is not requirements in an RFQ to truly get that information, to truly pick an architect that could build it the way we really are talking about building it. Instead, we're trying to achieve numbers <coughs> and not in the genuine way that Osceola County achieved those numbers. We're not putting it in the RFQ and saying, show me what you got. We're saying, we already see what you got, but now we want these other things added on top. We don't know what the cost is. We don't know if staff could even fix those things if they come up. And as they said today, the construction experts said, there are two ways to achieve this. One way is to do what Osceola County did, which was truly change the mechanisms, truly change the way they're working on things. And it was very interesting. But we haven't talked to staff to find out if they could even fix those things. And the construction team, the construction experts weren't even suggesting doing it that way anyway. They were suggesting just do solar, call it a day. That's how I heard it. <coughs> I am not against these 
items, but I am against this method. I do not believe this is the way we will achieve the things that I'm hearing we want to achieve. What Dr. Hope suggested is that we put on RFQ with these items and ask and see. We don't know how much it's going to cost. We don't know if we have the people that can fix it. We, we don't know uh, so many different things. We don't know what the building would truly look like if we wanted to achieve that. Neo City looks the way it looks because it was designed to be efficient. They talked about all the different aspects they took into account, every corner that they sealed. That's not in this. That's not even asking for this. This is just putting a round peg in a square hole or vice versa. That's how I see this. Um, on top of that, typically items like this aren't put in a contract. We have lots of contracts come before us. These construction items are not put in contracts. They're put in our construction manuals or they're put in an RFQ so that the people that are bidding know what they're getting into and we can pick someone based on their expertise. We don't know if this building has that expertise. We don't know if the people building the school have this expertise because those people have already gone out. They've already put out the RFQ. Dr. Hopes talked about the um, architect and the fees. Now, truthfully, if you compare both those contracts, there were fees that were less in the new architect contract, but overall it was more because other fees went up. So if you look at that, it, I get his point of view. If we can come up with something new, ooh, I gotta stop. But if we gotta come up with something new, then I'm for it. Let's start with Mr. Minor, start us off again. Thank you, Madam Chair. The purpose of this motion is to get to the bottom line of what this community needs and let the folks that get the money really figure out the best way to do it. I don't think that this board uh, going to Central Florida or sitting around are sufficiently knowledgeable and experienced to do that. You, you, to say that I, I don't agree about putting a square peg in a round hole, we're talking about uh, working on the existing uh, you know, plans and making modifications. The modifications would include what has proved to be successful, you know, up in Kissimmee. When asked about the questions of are these reasonable for the construction, the best authority in Florida about doing this said yes. Are these reasonable? Yes. And talking with the people that um, I think are the presumptive uh, uh, contractors, can you do this? Yes. Is your headquarters designed uh, to be energy efficient? Yes. And I think it's time that this board say yes. This is the, um, these provisions are reasonable. It, uh, I don't recall remarks like you do about uh, what you have to do. A lot of this will be involving the, the nature of how uh, the new school is tightened up as opposed to uh, Mona Jane. And when I say that, that and uh, it won't go forward, the paychecks won't go out unless the plans that are submitted to us for doing that are approved by you know, an outside auditor. We save the money to make sure that it is done. Um, and that's um, why that we have the, the three parts of this uh, you know, proposal or the, these provisions. Um, we, we have this is what needs to be done you know, something beyond anybody maybe in this room about, you know, exactly how to do it. That's number one. But that's, that's the goal. These, these are the standards. They are very reasonable standards according to the best authorities I know of and maybe the best authorities there are. I don't think that um, Mark uh, Clinch is oblivious to, who's from Osceola, is oblivious to the knowledge available in the University of uh, Central Florida in Orlando. He works with these people. This guy uh, has his, uh, he, he's an amazing fellow. I think those here were impressed with it. Uh, and he says, yes, this is doable. Okay, that's paragraph number one. Number two, that there be monitors in the, built into it. Um, 
And if you're, if you're going to have a system, we want to have um, that the uh, that there's going to be monitors in there, and there's going to be uh, meters, you know, to monitor what's going in, to uh, see how much energy we uh, need, how much is produced. I, I think if you're going to have a contract for anything like this, it's great to have monitors in it. Uh, number three, what, whatever uh, is to be done is going to be reviewed, uh, you know, by an auditor uh, for making sure that uh, the, the, the adjustments to Mona Jane's will meet uh, the uh, implementing, you know, the, these adjustments will bring about these very reasonable standards of uh, energy uh, use, the EUI, EUI, energy use intensity, and the, the amount of sealant with respect to, um, you know, the package. And uh, that's where a lot of, uh, you know, the savings comes from. Now, it's not, uh, you know, we're going to build the Eiffel Tower versus, um, you, know, you know, something else. It, it's still a school with a basic plan, but it's tightening up uh, ways of construction that uh, were uh, previously used, you know, to make it more efficient and having it in plans that are approved by an outside auditor that if you do this, you're going to achieve that. And we're saying we want this to be achieved, you know, to, you know, for energy efficiency, uh, for, you know, saving us money or making us money and being good for the environment. And um, I don't, and uh, I've shown this around to contractors. I showed it to uh, Mark Clinch and he said, you know, that Dave, uh, you know, this is the way to go. And it was on TV. And so I, I hope, you know, my comments Adam, address yeah. your concerns. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hopes, I hear you, but it's Mr. Kennedy's turn, and then you can go. Thank you, ma'am. I'll be quick. Um, Gina, I just wanted to correct you or, or share my what I heard at the workshop. Um, what Nathan from Willis Smith said is that not, not that it was going to be all solar, but that if we wanted to hit these numbers, there was going to have to be solar involved. The efficient building plus solar. So it, I heard something a little bit different, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is that we all seem to be on the same page that we want to increase efficiencies. We want to do this. I know Mr. Miner is only talking about SUG today, but we all want to do this for the long term. Um, but obviously here the devil is in the details with, with this project. And I do want to point out that Mona Jane, the Mona Jane construction was an empty field that we built a school on. The SUG project is a complete rebuild while the school is open. We're going to be building the school while the while the middle school is open, so it's a, it is to me a completely different um, project. Um, and then finally, um, Neo City, Mr. Mind, if you remember from the con the facilities workshop that we had, and there was the bar graph that showed that Neo City was about 300, I think 305 per square foot. Um, and then you know, as we heard at that same workshop, I think we built Parish High School for about 240, 250. Per square foot so if we're approving this tonight i think we have to accept um that we're going to be looking at a higher a much higher cost per square foot for construction because neo city didn't even you know as has been mentioned doesn't have the cafeteria doesn't have a gymnasium you know kind of some of those high energy use areas um so that that's just one concern i mean i'm, I'm totally supportive of it i'm supportive of it long term but i just want us to take that into account that we, you know, that there's going to be an increased cost up front, which I think is, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything that you guys don't already know, but, um, and then what are the payback numbers going to be? I mean, my, I'm not an expert on this, but I think they're going to be good uh, based on Neo City's experience. Um, but I, I just wanted to bring up those couple of details in the, in the conversation here. So that's it. Thanks, Jim. Dr. Hopes. Thank you. This is a very difficult conversation. Uh, Mr. Miner, for a question. Uh, will, if we are to incorporate these very detailed standards, will we require an SREF exemption? Did you hear his question? No, I, I didn't understand the, uh, the can you repeat with, the question? With these air exchange specifications, will this district require an SREF exemption? I don't know. But if it does, then we'll get it. And I, I, I can say 
that these standards, uh, these expectations, these requirements, however you call it, uh, have been considered uh, quite doable, reasonable, and I, or else I wouldn't be making this motion. When I say acceptable and all of that. Okay, uh, I, I, I'll give you the answer to the question. It will require an SREF exemption. I don't know if this district has ever built a school with an SREF exemption. Uh, I've been advocating it for a long time, but it will require an SRF exemption. There's a reason why you have air exchange. Uh, I, I think we, we do need to build an energy efficient school, and we probably need to start with some. I don't care if it's an extra six months. It's the right thing to do. We're spending a lot of money, and we're going to follow it with spending money again for another school. And, and Mr. Golden, I'm not talking about going on a field trip to look at a school. I'm talking about going on a trip to one of the major research universities in this state that has been studying energy efficiency in schools in the state of Florida. That's what I'm talking about because we're making decisions. And quite frankly, I don't know if any of us fully comprehend what we're talking about. I do know after looking through the plan that Mona Jane is not an efficient design. It's got large volumes. It's got windows that are letting heat in. And, and so to slap solar panels on it, to say we got solar panels, and to tighten the seal so that we reduce the air exchange, which means the air that children are breathing, they're rebreathing because we cut down on the air exchange, I'm not convinced it's the way to go. I offered a pathway to support a motion that would result in what I think we're all talking about, and that is a more energy efficient building for our children to learn in that can meet the program needs of our education leaders. Um, and you know, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna put criteria in here that quite frankly I haven't researched, I cannot vote for something I haven't researched. I can vote for a very clear direction to the superintendent that we want the next middle school that we build in this district to, to, to incorporate the leading energy efficiencies in both design and construction based on experts in the state that include. Uh -oh. Oh. oh. Right at the precipice. Um, oh. Okay, well, I hope he calls us back. Until then. Let's wait. <laughs> uh, Reverend Golden, you were next up. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I do not understand how um, the new Sug Middle School, which will arise out of the ashes of the old Sug Middle School, can be compared with a new school in another county that never existed. We, we just keep comparing apples and oranges here. I don't see even the word solar on here. Now, what I heard in the workshop was that 77% of the energy savings that came uh, out of the, uh, the, 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 the building there in, in, um, uh, in Osceola County came as a consequence of the changes in the construction and the way that they did it, that the 23% that they realized came about as a consequence of the way they changed the delivery of uh, the electrical service there. So they, 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 they have solar. Uh, and all those people came before us today and said was, if you have those same um, ratios, that the cost is going to go up of this, this, this building. I am not voting tonight to increase the cost that we've already stated that we are spending for this school. That's not what I was asked to do. I, all, all I've been asked to do is to add two provisions that govern construction. Now, whether that's what you should do and whether that's what you're supposed to do and whether that's the way we've ever done it before, that's what this board member is asking us to do tonight with these two particular provisions. Now, I am still not decided as to, as to whether or not this whether or not this is something that we need to be doing uh, that is going to, um, uh, that's going to justify uh, uh, solar energy or anything like that. I'm sort of like Dr. Hopes. I believe in the research and in the analysis, and I stick by 
what I said before. I'm not going to get a whole lot of research done and a whole lot of analysis going listening to some other people talk about something that doesn't have anything to do with this county. I am interested in people giving us information. Got a whole lot of opinions, but I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested. And we don't have any information here, none, not any more than when we started other than we've been asked to approve these two provisions, which are innocuous at worst, and at best, ask us to do something that we might not even agree to continue doing upon further analysis. In this situation here, we're just being asked to provide an automation system. I mean, that, there's a dollar amount to that. We're being asked to provide a type of construction that achieves a certain level of energy use intensity, uh, a certain air tightness. Now, they're going to come back and say to us, well, we can give you that, but it's going to cost you $5 million more. And that I will not support. I just be very clear about that. I'm not going to support that. This, if it can be done within the funds that we already know are limited, that we already know we can't do everything we want to do and need to do anyway. But if we can do that in the context of this is one of the eight projects that we set aside and we already have a certain amount of money, if it can be done within that budget, fine. But if it comes back one dollar more, no. And I don't care how good it sounds and how good it looks, but I do agree that the next middle school that we plan from the ground up knew that might be a time and a place for that. But we, we keep self-flagellating ourselves over, over this, this school. And it's not even a new school. It's a rebuilt school, and we keep holding them up. I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's, that's very productive. So I, I repeat, let's go ahead, give this board member what he has at least done enough research to ask about. And if it comes back and it doesn't cost any more, and if it starts us down the road to energy efficiency, that's a win-win. If it comes back and it's going to cost us five more million dollars to experiment, I don't see how he gets the votes necessary to approve that. We bought, we bought, this is already on our list. This is already something we said we want to do, something that we say we need to do, something that those children over there are waiting for us to get started on. Let's get started. Okay, we've had another go around, so I'd like to talk. Um, we, I don't quite understand how you this could be innocuous when this is being added to a legally binding contract. You, okay. Perhaps, perhaps you feel as if this can be negotiated out later, but what this is doing is adding it to a contract. It is not saying we would like to add it to our specs. It's not saying we'd like to add it to our RFQ to talk about, to negotiate. It is saying it's going to be in the contract. That's not what, this is not innocuous. This is saying- say It will increase the cost. That is true. But it is saying that it's going to be added to the contract. But it does not increase the cost. And what you are bound by- it Will increase is the cost. It costs. But it, it, it will does, absolutely increase the cost. We know it, that. If it does, then vote it down now. But I am saying to you that there is nothing in here that commits us to increasing the cost. What we have done here is we have required the people in this contract to comply with these terms. If they say in order to comply with these terms, it will cost you more money, that's another change in the contract. And I have already said I will not support that. Sounds as if now we would like to create an unfunded mandate to say, yes, we would like to do these things, but we're not going to fund it to do these things. Not so then it's school. quite ceremonial that we're just going to approve this, That's but it's never really going to happen because it's going to cost more. We all know it's going to cost more. We have no idea how much it's going to cost because we don't know that because this was put here. We have no idea how much it's really going to cost. That's what innocuous means. Exactly. So why are we going through all of these changes for an innocuous change? Because if we add this 
and then we say, gosh, man, we really can't afford this. This is another $10 million. Then we're going to have this whole conversation again to remove it. No, we don't. You don't have to remove it. What you have to get is someone to build to the dollar amount that you have. And if they can't, they will not. They will not. Then we'll be right back where we started from. But I'm saying to you, I suspect that before we go down that road, what we're really going to say is, you know what, this is a good idea and it'll be a good idea for the next school. Let's go forward with building the school with the plans that we already had in place for the dollar amount that we already agreed and let's not experiment with these children. That's what will happen. I, I, I agree with you in the word experiment. I feel like this is an experiment. I don't think this is a good experiment. I think that we could be methodical and plan it properly if this is a desire by the board to really see these things happen i'm in favor of that but then let's be truly methodical about it as osceola county was and as they continue to do because in the presentation yesterday mr clinch also talked about how they are planning on building a school that will be a k-8 to school it will have a cafeteria i would assume it would also have a gym just like sug they are methodically planning that for these things so to me, I don't understand the purpose of adding this to a contract to perhaps then it be innocuous in the contract. And it, I don't understand the purpose. It gets I truly you. don't understand. I'm, that's a very genuine thing. I do not understand the purpose at this point. You, but it gives you answers that you don't have tonight and that you're not gonna get tonight. If you're interested at all, in seriously exploring how much it costs to make us energy efficient and cost effective, you must make a decision that leads you in that direction. I agree with that statement. There are lots of ways that I could make that decision and putting it in a contract is not the best way to do that. There are ways where we could direct the superintendent to have Mrs. Drager really look into that and she could come back and give us a workshop where we could really get some in-depth information about these things, how much each of these things would cost, how they would be done, and if it would be better to come up with a plan, a new plan or not, because she's the expert in this. I'm not, you're not, he's not, he's not, he's not. We're not, that's not our expertise. And to do this is putting, uh, I really believe it'll have unintended consequences. A lot of unintended consequences in doing it in this way. I don't, I'm not against these ideas, but I'm against the way this is happening. This is not a thoughtful way to do it. This is not a methodical way to do it. And we're talking about almost $60 million. If we wanna do this, let's do it right. Otherwise, don't say you wanna do it and then go, oh, well, it didn't cost, it cost too much. I'm not gonna do it anyways then it wasn't, there wasn't even enough thought in it there. Uh, either we want to really do it and we mean it and we put up and we try to create a plan that really does it or we don't. Adding this to the contract to me doesn't achieve either one of those two things. That's just my opinion on that. Uh, Dr. Hopes, you got cut off before. Are you still there? Yes, ma'am. Would you like to finish I, I, your comment? And I think if, if we really are going to make a commitment to energy efficiency, then we need to look at, at the design. This is, this is slapping a couple of criteria on there that I, I, I think it's moot. I mean, if, if our colleagues on the board who've been talking about this for three years are serious about having energy efficient schools, renewable energy, then the way to do it is, as you have said, methodically, deliberately relying on experts and data and moving that forward. But this business about let's hurry up and replace a school that's been there for however many years, just so we can hurry up and spend that money and not waste another four weeks so we can get these contractors off our back, as opposed to realizing that over the course of the next five years, we're gonna be building two of these schools. According to the projections, we're gonna be building two of these schools. Now's the time to do it right. If you want an energy efficient school, then let's do it right. Let's make sure that the school's designed to meet the programs that our educators and our experts in curriculum and instruction need to have in that school to fully allow our students to succeed to their maximum potential and design an energy efficient building that will reduce our consumption of energy, that will incorporate renewable energy. 
but to just take an old design, slap a couple of criteria on here to create a, a reduce the air exchange. Reducing the air exchange in itself is going to save energy. But that's not the way I think we need to spend fifty-eight million dollars. And then by we turn time, we turn around and build the, the the same thing again. It's probably going to be sixty-five million. So we're talking about one hundred twenty million dollars. That's what we're talking about. And we're saying we don't want to waste another four weeks to make sure that we're doing it right and reducing our energy costs moving forward. And with that, I just I can't support it. I don't think we need to discuss it anymore. I think we need to say we want an energy efficient design that meets the program needs of our district for educating these middle school students. And we're going to do it right. And that's not what I'm hearing right now. Thank you. And, and I'm disappointed. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. I am with you. Vice Chair Kennedy, you, you have signed up to speak. Um, Dr. Hopes, I'm assuming that's directed at me. And my question about the timing. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not directed at you. Well, I'm it's the one that brought directed. up the timing, so I, um, whatever. Um, that I posed a question about the timing. I'm not trying to get anybody off my back. I also want to, again, we all want the same thing here. We want to do this right. We want to make a step toward en energy efficiency. I will be happy to go to UCF and learn more about this. Um, because I've learned so much already in the past. And I just want to present um, this as a possible scenario. Again, this is a question. This is not an edict or an order. But if we were to approve this tonight, and then we put out the RFQ, or um, you know, we, we put this out for to get some price feedback, and then it came back to us, and it didn't make financial sense, because the cost is going to be higher but the question I think we need to know the answer to, and we don't tonight, is what will the payback be? Um, and so if, to Reverend Golden's point, if it does come back and this board decides the price tag is too high, we just have to do a contract amendment. Am I, am I correct about that? Is that right, attorney? Well, you, you won't be in a contract. That's right. So there's nothing to amend. You just you kind of start over. Okay. Remember, it was the three step. They don't have an actual contract yet. You're going out to begin the stage. In three months, they'll have their official GM contract. So if you sign this tonight with the expectation, when she comes back for the cost, that's when you get that final contract and you would have all the information. Right. Thank you. That's what I thought. But a lot of the preliminary other stuff we could get going on. Ab yes, no sir. What? Because right now we're not doing anything. That is correct. Right. Mr. Miner. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. What I think is absent from this discussion is the focus on the criteria. This criteria is for any contract regarding sub. Be it based on Mona Jane's or what? And it's setting forth a requirement of design by any architect, any engineer, construction by any you know, builder, that the new Sug Middle School will be meeting you know, certain requirements of energy efficiency, uh, and you know, how it's built. We leave it to them to figure out how to do this in an efficient way and come back to us. That's, that's the idea behind this. Uh, they do the research, they figure it out, and they come back you know, with you know, a price tag which may or may not be acceptable to us. Um, and, you know, that's the thinking, you know, behind this. Uh, call it humble that I don't know all how to do this, but it's certainly informed. It's informed by talking with contractors, talking with the experts that, yes, what you're asking for is reasonable, Yes, what you're asking for is doable. And it really, if we're serious about climate change, if we're serious about efficiency, you know, for 
our constituents, the people in Madison <coughs> County, then you want to have this in the contracts. We just have never done it before, but it should be. But this motion is really directed to the next school that we're building, a new, you know, Sug Middle School. And it's, it's a state, it's saying uh, to our community and anyone who's going to have contracts along this line, this is the focus. We're going to have the, the school is going to be energy efficient. It's going to be environmentally uh, responsible. And that's all I'm asking tonight is that we uh, have a motion or we approve the motion that this be added you know, to contracts regarding whatever it comes out to be, the new uh, Sug Middle School you know, construction. It's pretty simple in a way. But I think it's required if we're going to move forward with what I think we should do for the environment, what we should do in terms of economics, you know, for our community. I think this is long-term, most economical way to go about it, certainly the most environmentally responsible way to go it, and that's why I'm asking, you know, for my colleagues, you know, support and vote to approve this this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll call the question. Perfect. Um, I think there has to be a second to call the question. Correct. I second. Okay. Um, and then there has to be a supermajority vote to call the question. Really? Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Don't you remember? Oh. We've had this conversation okay. before. Yeah. I'll never forget that. Yeah, because we're voting to end debate. Yes. Okay. So, uh, all those in favor to call to question, please signify by saying aye. 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 I think that was unanimous. So let's vote on this. It is, wow. the, it is the approval of the three amendments that Mr. Miner uh, read into the record it, to add um, those three amendments um, as contract provisions to be added to the new SAG Middle School construction. Am I stating that I think for pretty, the record for you? Pretty, pretty much sums it up. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Nay. And I think it passes. Three to two. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Minor, and Reverend Golden voting in favor, and uh, Dr. Hopes and myself voting against. All right. Let's move on to item number eight. And that is from the superintendent. Madam Superintendent, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend the approval of the amended best and brightest teacher and principal award distribution protocol for physical year 2019-2020. So moved. Okay, I've got a motion. Second. And a second. Is there any public comment on this? Uh, no, I believe that was it. Let me okay. Let me double check. Um, no. Is there any discussion? Yeah, I, I just have a question. Is this the... Um, Is this the pre-K allocate? This is not it? No, nope, oh. this is the K-12 to best and brightest for this current year that has to be paid out by April 1st. But didn't, didn't the pre-K teachers ask to be? They, they did ask questions. Uh, they are not uh, allowed to be out of this pot of distribution. So if the board chooses or chose to pay them based on the same criteria, it will need to come out of the general fund. Okay, but that's not even calculated the same no, way as best and brightest. I'm thinking of a whole different. You would need to calculate, to award them in the same manner that you, based on the same criteria, but it, it cannot come out of this pot of money because the state does not fund it. It will need, so that will need to be a board conversation and decision if the board wants to do, to do that. And we can so do this. No, sir, uh, we had um, an amendment to this because we had, um, we found some, some teachers that did qualify that were not in the original list. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Thank you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Vice Chair Kennedy. Uh, yeah, I just want to address the same thing that Reverend Golden did, and, and the, now the superintendent has too. I, um, you know, still uh, pre-K teachers, uh, school social workers. You know, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of job titles that work directly with kids that should share in this money, but because of Florida statute doesn't call them teachers, um, especially a pre-K teacher. Um, that would, which we have done in the past, we have made that allocation from the general fund, and I guess I can do this in workshop requests, but um, so I'll save it for them but to gather that information mm -hmm. to see what that price tag would be. Well, if, oh, it's already if you're already asking me, I can, I, can, uh, I can get that information and email it to you as soon as it's gathered. That'd be great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Reverend Golden, didn't you second this? Can you hit the button? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Find it. Where is that little arrow? Oh, there it is. The green rectangle. There you go. There you go. Oh, no, I got the rectangle part. It's the little arrow that flits across the Oh, streets. I get the <clears throat> mouse arrow. Mine's a hand. Um, okay. Is there any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right. That moves us on to public comment. It's all you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Dr. Hopes. I'm going to head back to the Capitol, see what kind of trouble I can get into. Okay, I wish you luck. I'm going to sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. That's the name of the bar there. Okay. <laughs> um, probably have, uh, three. Is this my, my app now? Yeah. Uh, three public comments tonight. Um, Brittany Marks Renneberg. Brittany, still here? Oh, God, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Bridget, you're up. Mrs. Mendel. Oh, God. I got the Hi, Bridget Mendel. Um, I'm going to bring you back to the night that uh, Rodney Jones was arrested um, over my public comment where I requested that we not cover the legal fees for our superintendent. Um, and we had heard that um, the taxpayers were indeed not paying these fees. There was an objection, there was an arrest, and a big uproar. Um, I decided to do a public records request, and I did get um, about $25,000 worth of invoices for when, from 2017 when we were paying legal fees for the two firms that are representing our superintendent. And, um, but then I got a $500 uh, invoice. And so, hmm, that was clearly a, a method of, of discouraging me. So I said, well, just to try to prove the point, which I already knew was the truth, I did a public records request for the superintendent's um, employment contract. And I'd like to read to you from page 11, section 10.1. The board agrees as a further condition of this employment contract that it shall defend, hold harmless, and indemnify the superintendent from any and all demands, claims, suits, actions, and legal proceedings brought against the superintendent in her official capacity as agent or employee of the school board of Manatee County, Florida, or with regard to any and all demands, claims, suits, actions, and legal proceedings brought against her in her individual capacity, which arise out of the performance of any of her duties as superintendent to the full extent as permitted by the laws of the state of Florida. So the contract is very clear. We are paying these legal fees. Um, I'm gonna request that if, um, for myself to go in and personally go through and call through the other records because I would like an exact dollar amount for what we paid for the first settlement and now what we are already, I'm sure, receiving bills on for the second settlement. Um, it's here, it's in black and white. Um, let's see, I'd like to continue on. Uh, the superintendent agrees that the defense of any such legal proceedings is to be defended through counsel approved by the board. And those were the two firms that you did both approve. In fact, you had a closed meeting with a court reporter where you met with uh, Ms. Jackson to discuss the second settlement that we are all indeed paying for based on her employment contract. Um, the board <laughs> approval shall not be unreasonably withheld. So clearly you didn't withhold it for the first settlement and you're more than happy to cover up fraud and correction for a second settlement on my dime on the backs of public school children here in our county. 
This provision shall survive the term of this agreement and shall remain in full force and effect until the expiration of the time for the institution of any action at law or equity or administrative action against the superintendent under either federal law or the laws of Florida, except as otherwise here and provided. Um, she lost the settlement. Florida statutes were violated, and yet here we are paying for round two. Thanks, Mrs. Medal. Um, Mrs. Medal, I, I just want to address one thing you said. The the shade meeting that we had with Aaron Jackson, that's related to the LMA case. Aaron, when you when you see Aaron Jackson, that's you can't you can't talk yeah. about that. Of course, it's public knowledge that who represents us in the LMA case. You can't talk about what was said in the shade meeting. When the shade. When the shade meeting is noticed, it says we are meeting with this attorney about this matter. That's a, that's a, that's a public, I'm not talking about the details of the shade meeting. I'm talking about who represents whom. Mr. Dye, am I wrong? No, you're right. The, Thank you. The reason for the meeting is public. Yeah, that's, and that's all I said. Okay. This is the attorney. This is the matter being discussed. That's public knowledge. I apologize. No problem. Um, okay, one more. Uh, Isabel McLone. Ma'am, would you mind pronouncing your name correctly? I'm sorry about that. Oh, I got it right. Okay. You don't want to have to say my Spanish. <laughs> um, well, thank you. I applaud you for taking the time. And um, I'm coming from a country, South America, Colombia, where I don't get to see this and a lot of people working in, in the behalf of the students in the school. So I applaud you for your time and everything. But today I'm a resident of the Manatee County and parish and um, also a mother. But I also represent the construction and the solar industry. I work for Renewable Energy. And um, a word that you haven't mentioned over here is sustainability. You guys trying to get to that point, that is sustainability. Energy efficiency is one point of sustainability. So what you guys trying to do to the school is doable, yes. But also, I agree that you do need the factors that you didn't have today, which is a preliminary analysis with numbers and factors, how much it costs, how much many panels do you need? They how, many, how many panels are you going to need? Because if you follow this, this is a great project, but your, um, your project that you're uh, referring to, it might not need that many. So you have to have an analysis how much energy consumption is needed and how much energy production is needed. So um, being part of the construction uh, industry also as a general contractor for Burke Construction Group, um, we would like to um, to be put our name out there to I know I'm not doing any commercial or anything but if you need any reference of uh, about about where to get the information uh, I know the center is being referred to go and find it but my, my my question is before you make any decision you need to have those factors in place you need to have the numbers. You need to have the, 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 the what is needed for, how long it's going to take. And yes, it's going to change the number of the budget and whatever you have in place. So my only, my only suggestion is here is to get the advice that you need. You don't need to get it from me, obviously, <laughs> or from none of us. But before you put it out there, know what you want before you ask for it. So you get the right information and you don't waste time because time seems to be very important uh, for the school and everything. So I know it's a lot of resources that the school have in their hands that they can use to request for this information before you put an RQ there or anything like that. So and um, my, I just want to applaud you because sustainability, we are in the state of solar. We are in the state of electricity. We are in the, st in the state that you need less panels and produce more energy. So use that for your advantage. Use it, the, the sustainability today is the future of our child. And I have a six-year-old boy that I want him to be in a clean environment. And and it depends on the decision that you guys made over here that's going to benefit him. And I want him to not only use this as saving and money, but as an education, as a pilot project for him to talk about it in other schools and be proud about it. So thank you so much for the, for the time. <coughs> Any mind if you give them three minutes? Three minutes? 
promised me five. Well, I, I think in total we're over five, right? <laughs> I did, but it's, you know. It's late. I know. We're tired. Okay. So, um, all right. Just on the uh, square footage, uh, the, the extra cost will be made up by the solar on the other 25 years. Okay. So, here we go. Rock and roll. The broken record syndrome. Uh, the overhead projector. This is my seventh request, along with emails that I've made uh, to have the overhead projector. We spend millions of dollars on, on contracts, and we can't get a few hundred dollars to put an overhead projection. So again, I'm going to request the overhead projection, and I wish this board would instruct the <coughs> administrator to put one up there, because I don't think it's too much to ask for the public. Second issue, cell phones. I cannot believe we're still, we, we're not doing a demonstration project with at least one school for cell phones. Let's get rid of them. If you want to get data on student performance, take a school and eliminate the cell phones. I guarantee you, if you did it to one school, it would be a choice school by most parents because they don't like them either. We lose productivity. 25% of the teacher times is being a babysitter, and it reduces productivity of the student. Take a teacher survey. Get down in the trenches with them. Ask them out how much time they spend babysitting. Undo your cell phone. Don't put it up. You know, it's, it's insane that we do it. So I'm asking, out of the 60 schools, we deserve to do one demonstration project. Impact fees. Need to redo that. I know we're, we're looking at down the road, but in the meantime, you can do an abatement through a resolution to uh, eliminate impact fees for affordable housing. We still have an affordable housing issue here. Uh, Channel 10 came out and interviewed me this morning. I talked about the homeless students and vets. It's airing out at uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, Robert Boyd, ABC 10. Um, the new schools, the new uh, schools on the hardening. I understand we did harden, we did harden one of them, and that's fine. But here's my point: the county is willing to give you money to harden the schools. They are. You're rolling your eyes, Gina. Have you ever reached out and called them? I, Have you called them? I don't normally respond, but yes, okay. I believe that we did do that when we built. And, did, all and would they come up with the money? No, we they, asked. Really. Really? Okay. Well, I would like to have that conversation because that's not what the commissioners told me. So I'll do a records request on that because I need to see that in writing because I'll go there and raise a little hell myself. <laughs> uh, the other thing is the uh, the 15 books with the mirror and, mirror and windows, have they been vetted okay. by the county? So will any student come and read any book regardless of subject matter? Is that right? I have a problem with that. Um, so... That's it. Time's up. They're not coming up with any money. I'm going to go get them. All right. I'll take it. I'll get that. You do it. I will. That'll do it. Thank you. Okay. We are on to workshop item requests. And I heard Mr. Kennedy mention um, the VPK item. That might really be more of a uh, an agenda item because uh, you already have the numbers. Um, Worked oh, out. Just go straight to a, an action so, item. email, and we can just put it on the agenda. We can do that if there's support. The Absolutely, I would love to see that happen. Um, I, I, I guess I was under the impression that there was other avenues that were being explored, which is why I didn't they put were, it on the agenda. But, it but didn't pan out. Okay. Well, then I'm 100% in favor of that. Um, are there any other workshop item requests? I do. Um, I, I, I asked for, about the affordable housing one previously, so I just want to make sure that's in the queue. Okay. For coming up. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mike Penley at Construction Department for um, helping me out with some um, information for that that we can use at that workshop. And then um, you, you guys, have, you don't have to cut me off if I've already talked about this, but the issue, I've already brought it into the our financial oversight committee over the referendum funds. Um, but I'll, I'll keep this as short as possible. Um, Essentially, when we passed the referendum, it was at 14.5% of our students were in charters, and that number is now 16.2. So um, there's an inequity there um, on, a, on a per student basis. And so I'd like the board to just kind of take a look at the numbers um, and then talk about do we want to rectify that 
and bring that disbursement to the charter schools up to their actual student population. Um, because like I said, we're dispersing at 15.5%, which two years later is now 1.7% short. So um, again, I don't know if that's, we could go straight to an agenda item with that, or you guys want to talk about it first? Because um, it's not an easy question because there's pros and cons to. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have workshop it because mm -hmm. it, it does relate to the millage. So I just, I, I think there needs to be conversations that we make sure that we're following whatever the written, <laughs> But I just, I, I'll make sure we have all those documents that we can put on there. Yeah. Any other workshop requests? Okay, let's move on to legal updates. I'll defer. It's been, I think you're up to speed with everything. Awesome. Um, instructional update? Yes, ma'am, only a single item to share that we are <clears throat> collaborating with New College to develop a partnership. It's a liberal arts college. We're hoping to um, motivate students to join our workforce as educators. As a matter of fact, we have two of them in our school system already, one that's a music teacher and one that's an art teacher. So we are continuing to develop that partnership. And that's all for tonight. Great. I don't <clears throat> know if Mr. Wagner has hung out with us the whole night or not. Do we know? He has. Oh, look at you. Oh, hey. I'm ready. I have three items, Madam Chair. Great. <laughs> okay. Very good. So item number one, you know, after three years of coverage with our vendor, All Clear, uh, they've uh, changed their policy and no longer offer group coverage. So we opted for another vendor to pick up the identity theft uh, monitoring. And so that information went out Friday afternoon to all employees and we need them to either call the number or uh, register online. So it's not an automatic registration. They have to opt in themselves by either calling or going online. Uh, number two, food and nutrition. So like we've done before, our spring break feeding is gonna take place. Uh, we'll be providing children free lunch during spring break, March 16th through the 20th. The free meals will be offered to students 18 or younger as part of the spring break food service program. Two food and nutrition service mobile feeding buses and a caboose will deliver meals to seven stops. The stops are in the north part, uh, Turner Chapel and Lincoln Park in Palmetto. Uh, the south locations are Southeast High School, Bradenton Village Apartments, and City Stop in downtown Bradenton. And the caboose locations are Manatee Memorial, Manatee Mobile Home Park, and Pride Park, Bradenton, uh, Rain or Shine. So. We have all the information of times and locations on our food and nutrition website, which is manatee-school-food.net. And number three, I just want to give a shout out. We had recently we had the uh, state office of Safe Schools uh, sent a team member down to walk through three of our schools and observe the safety and security initiatives and best practices that have been implemented since the Parkland tragedy. Uh, they were very pleased with the three schools visited, which was Tillman, Braden River High School, and Nolan Middle School. Uh, we'd like to thank all staff for making safety and security a priority. We'll continue to conduct safety assessments uh, to keep our staff, faculty, and students as safe as possible. Thank you to uh, Paul D'Amico, our chief, for making sure we had good reviews. Those are my three items. Thank you. Let's move on to superintendent remarks. Yes, just a couple of things. Uh, this time of year, uh, all of the schools have received uh, their allocations uh, for the upcoming school year uh, with changes in our zoning uh, plans that we have already approved that go into effect for next year. Uh, we've also uh, began the process of posting our administrative vacancies. So those uh, hirings should occur by uh, April the 14th and uh, then the next wave will start. So uh, we are in the middle of our hiring season. And uh, for those of you that are interested or looking for employment in Manatee County, please go to our website and uh, apply for any vacant positions that you find. In, a, in addition, I know we spoke a lot in depth about the coronavirus. Um, I am <clears throat> having two calls tomorrow, conference calls one of which is with all of our traditional principals uh, at 8.30, and then I'm gonna follow that up at 12.30 with all of our charter principals. 
just to make sure that everyone is uh, on the same page with the information coming from the CDC. Uh, it, it is changing daily now and also to make sure that all of our students and parents <coughs> are up to date <coughs> with all of those changes. So um, that will be going out. We know that we do not have students in school on Friday. It is a teacher work day. It is not a student day. So really they're only in school for two more days before uh, spring break. Uh, we do hope to have a lot of cleaning that happens, but there will be procedures when we come back to ensure safety and security for all and to ensure that if there are travels that have happened outside of the country, we're following the CDC requirements. So uh, just make sure that you're staying tuned over the holiday and paying attention to our updates because we'll keep everything posted online as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, Reverend Golden, you want to start us off? Yes. Uh, when I first came to this community back in the 90s, there was a... Um, an arrangement between Bethune-Cookman University and the school system in terms of interns, uh, internships. I know that there were classes. I think Dr. Mona Jane uh, was in charge of that or responsible for that. Uh, I don't know whether this might not be a better subject for a workshop or not, but I'd like to see if that can be uh, revitalized. Uh, I don't know what happened or why, uh, but um, I, I still have ties there at Bethune-Cookman, and I, I said that I would bring it up to see. There was a long-standing relationship between the Cookman founder, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, and the uh, Garfield DeVoe Rogers <coughs> family here in this area. So there was, uh, there's been a lot of connectivity between the two communities. I, I don't know where to go from here with that, but uh, I don't know whether that Okay, Michelle. The second thing is that the organization that we recognized here earlier this year, Sugar, and that came and helped us with the, um, with the homeless children during the Christmas holidays, they have asked me, um, they want to do another outreach to group home students, uh, our students who are in group homes, uh, and they're having difficulty breaching the security and safety aspects but i figured if anybody could get through that or, or, or if they could come through us to do for those group home children uh, they, they simply want to give things to them not books but baskets and i guess things that kids would need uh, and i don't know how to i don't know whether to direct them they 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 are going through the department of juvenile justice and apparently that's a real impediment in terms of safety and security, I understand that. But maybe if they had someone to vouch for them or someone to inter be, be the intermediary for them, could we do that? She'll, she'll see what she can do uh, in regards. She'll, she Because it falls under her division here uh, if they're going to school. So uh, Ms. Shows will look into it and get back in touch. All right. And I guess the third thing, trifecta, I'm sure, uh, that young lady, um, that made this present, I, that is just absolutely, I'm still amazed at how well she presented herself, how, how, what's her name, Michaela? Michaela. She should be named Sue or Mary or something like that, I can remember that. But she, it was just, I want to do something to keep that fire burning. She has identified a very real problem that we have, not only in this community, in this country. We still don't know each other. We still don't understand each other. A lot of us are afraid of one another. And, and, and just the idea, that gives me hope. Now, I don't know, I wasn't quite so sure whether she wanted $14,000 of school or $14,000 for the year for all schools. I thought that's terrible. Yeah for, for fifth, yeah, for all schools. Now, how quickly can I get that? Not today. On an agenda. No, well, uh, <laughs> but can, I, can we get it on the, the very it next? It doesn't need to be on the agenda technically, sir. It's, it, it's below a threshold. So. Okay. And, and so, okay. But Ms. Yes will work with the school. Three now. Okay. All right. Then I, 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 the third time's a charm, so I'll, I'll be quiet. I'm, I'm done. Thank, thank you so very, very much. That was, um, that was just so moving. Um, it was really great.
And I, I really want to encourage that. And I know that we are still working on one of the projects uh, that, that you and I, well, we'll talk about that offline. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you. You are a formidable advocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you know, I didn't say adversary. You are a formidable advocate for your position. And I, I thank you. It, 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 I, I, I almost changed my vote. <laughs> but thank you very much. I, I really appreciate um, the way in which you're leading us and stewarding us through some difficult waters. You learned well from Attorney Minor. Yes, you did. <laughs> I didn't say what you learned. <laughs> you, you learned it well. <laughs> okay. You learn as much from the non-examples as you do the examples. Is that your point? I, now, see, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. No, no. I'm just kidding, Mr. Ryder. Please, yeah. it's your turn. Make her buy us dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's back there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Mr. Miter, you're up. Well, <clears throat> uh, events of the day reminded me, you know, back in the early years when I was very, very young, um, I, I was attorney for Corona. I'll leave it at that, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it, uh, it's, it's quite a night, um, but I remember a, a wonderful night a couple of weeks ago down at the school in Sarasota, um, you know, the Ringling School or College of Art and Design, and uh, I was taken out to dinner there. Uh, well, everybody was invited, uh, you know, for the dinner of embracing our differences, and uh, Dr. Gibson was there. I guess Shireen's already left, but. Um, so I took her to dinner there for free. Uh, it was a lot of great food there, but uh, it it was one of those uh, events that really brings out the sap in me. Uh, that uh, I'm uh, I uh, I'm really mo emotionally affected, you know, by the love that's expressed in the artwork and the sayings that were everywhere, and uh, I just. I think it's a wonderful event, a wonderful cause. I, I felt very fortunate you know, to be there, uh, those who put it on. Um, I think you know that uh, one of our circuit judges, uh, Judge Williams, uh, plays an uh, important role in that. I think he's uh, chairman of the board, and I have a great respect uh, you know, for him and his, and his family, too. So, um, it's been quite a night, and thank you for in the public uh, the privilege of being here. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Cracker Barrel closes at ten. That's all hey, I know. I hear you have priorities, uh, Vice Chair Kennedy. <laughs> really, really quick. I just want to thank Eugenia for, um, as Reverend Golden noted, your um, your leadership of this board, and the way you prepare and the way you run a meeting is exemplary. And uh, I think it was International Women's Day the other day, so I'd yes, say uh, right. give you, give you a, uh, our International Woman of Leadership over here. Um, and really to the, I, the superintendent and yeah. Superintendent Yost um, uh, and, and all the staff that work for you, um, I really can't do this job without all the help and support I get from you and from, from our employees. Um, and uh, Michelle and Kelly, just keep putting up with us. You know, we, just, we, we appreciate you guys. Because um, they're the ones that have really had the longest day. Uh, don't worry about us. You know, it's, uh, it's you guys over there. So um, that's it. I mean, we're, um, hope everybody uh, washes their hands and stays safe. I, re I really appreciate uh, you putting that presentation together. It was very informative and will certainly be, uh, be helpful since there are so many of us attached to the school district in this county. So um, thanks, everybody. Good night and good luck. Okay, it is almost 9.30, we're at like 9.28. And with that, with no objections, what, you want me to comment? Yes. We made it through. See you at Cracker Barrel. We made it through. Oh, okay. We got a lot done. A lot of progress, a lot of good conversation. And it's now 9.30, look what you made me do. Good night, y'all.